Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Cartwright Elementary School District Governing Board regular board meeting for October 14th, 2021. We do apologize for the delay in beginning our meeting. We ran into some technical difficulties, and so I'd like to let the record reflect that the meeting has um, begun at 5.18 p.m., and we are in session. So this evening, we do have present in the governing board room uh, Ms. Lydia Hernandez, Governing Board Member. Thank you for being here this evening, Ms. Hernandez. Uh, Vice President Denise Garcia is also present in the Governing Board Room as well. Thank you for being here, Ms. Garcia. And we also have Governing Board Member Mr. Pedro Lopez telephonically participating this evening. And so thank you, Mr. Lopez, for being here this evening. And I myself, Ms. Hernandez, President, am also present as well. So moving on to item two. We do have um, our Pledge of Allegiance this evening and we have some very special guests to introduce that for us. It is our Manuelito Pena Elementary School Scholars. And this evening we have Jalea Trigger, Chloe Bonner, Jalen Johnson, Shaylin Dubois, Ruben Cruz, Diego Cortez, Marcus Gastelum, Mario Lopez, Sanaya Smith, Devani Dominguez, Daniel Flores, Shayla Sanchez, and Leticia Cuellar. From Manuelita Peño, sorry, Manuelito Peño Elementary School. Tongue tied. All right, cue the video. Thank you. And please rise to join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you so much. Can't wait till the day that we can actually have them here, but a video is the next best thing. So proud of our students. All right, so this evening, item three is our adoption of agenda. So I would like to make a motion that we adopt our agenda as presented at this evening's Cartwright Elementary School District regular governing board meeting for Thursday, October 14th, 2021. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. So we do have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and a second by Ms. Lydia Hernandez. Any discussion? All right, so we will go ahead and do a roll call vote. Ms. Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Vice President Garcia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Uh, Governing Board Member Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. I vote as well, and the, the motion carries un unanimously. Thank you. All right, so this evening we have some very special guests with us in person in the boardroom. And so we do have our parent representative, Ms. Laura Martinez, she's our parent representative and also the president of our parent advisory council. So Ms. Laura Martinez has two children. Her daughter previously attended Sunset and Estrella Middle School, and currently she is a 12th grader. Her son is an eighth grader attending Raul H. Castro Academy of Fine Arts, and Ms. Martinez has been part of the Cartwright School District community for 12 years and enjoys being involved in the schools that her children attend. Laura Martinez is the Parent Advisory Council President and has held that title for four years and feels honored, and she does a great job at it. She is a great listener, communicator, and advocate for our scholars and families, and Ms. Martinez also participates in a group for children with special needs. As a parent, she appreciates how our Superintendent, Dr. Aguilar Luller, has handled the pandemic and the return of this 2021-2022 school year, protecting our scholars and their families. Thank you for spending your time here with us this evening, Ms. Martinez. We appreciate you being here. We also have um, our principal representative this evening, Mr. Jeremy Chandler. Jeremy Chandler is a proud principal of Sunset School. This is his third year as principal and seventh year at Sunset after working as the assistant principal. Prior to beginning his career as a school administrator, he worked as a teacher in fourth through seventh grades and worked as a data coordinator for Cartwright School District. Jeremy received his bachelor's degree in elementary education from St. John's University, no, not the fancy St. John's in New York, and master's degree in educational leadership from Arizona State. He has lived in Phoenix for the past 11 years after moving from the tundra of Olivia, um, Minnesota, Jeremy loves the day-to-day -day excitement of being a principal. His greatest joy this school year 
is seeing the growth in those kindergarten scholars he met in 2015 become the brilliant sixth graders he has the joy of working with each day. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here this evening, uh, Principal Chandler. It is a pleasure to have you. And last but certainly not least, we have Michella Stevens, who is our Cartwright Education Association president and representative for the evening. Michella Stevens is an avid elective teacher at Atkinson Middle School. She started teaching in Las Vegas and made her way to the Cartwright School District in 2017. She enjoys promoting college and career readiness to her students. Ms. Stevens, thank you for being here this evening. It's nice to have um, two more presidents here with us. So thank you. Thank you for being here. We're excited to have you. All right, so we will move on to item five, which is our Cartwright School District number 83 Award of Excellence presented by Ms. Veronica Sanchez. Good evening, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, governing board members, executive team, and those joining us via YouTube and in the audience. We are honoring a total of five individuals tonight, three teachers, excuse me, one teacher, two assistants, one scholar, and one parent. As a team, they all collaborated and put in place uh, safe and caring structures to ease our second grader into class on a daily basis. It was a challenging task to do this since our student is a special education scholar and is on the autistic spectrum. But with grace and with patience, our REACH teacher and her two assistants allowed him to feel comfortable at his own pace and implored the use of social emotional techniques in order for a good outcome. And because of their hard work and dedication and because of the trust that their mother uh, had in the entire process, our scholar, Victor Cardenas, is thriving at school and walks into class by himself with ease. We also want you to know that our REACH program is successful because it trains the entire staff on how to deal with our special education scholars. So in that sense, it is basically like a community of educators supporting our children and their parents. So it truly is a beautiful thing. I want to thank Alma Sotelo, my administrator, uh, who first witnessed this when she was taking her own grandchildren to Tarver. It's a great reminder to everyone in our district that examples of greatness are all around us and that we need to celebrate them whenever we spot them. So thank you to everyone involved in this award. And please come forward to accept the award of excellence. We have our REACH teacher here today, Kirby Cabrera, who will come here and accept her, her certificate. Gladys Amaya and Jacqueline Macias are not here today, but we will get them their certificate. You are muted. You can mute or unmute yourself by pressing star six. Well, thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> could we have Kirby come down? And could we please have our governing board members and our superintendent come down and take a picture with Kirby? I also want to let you know that Victor and his mother were here today and we gave him a certificate out in the hallway. Smile with your eyes. Yes. Yes. Congratulations again, Kirby, Gladys, Jacqueline, Victor, and his mother. We are so proud of all of you. We also want to let you know that we would like to thank Chase for sponsoring this award of excellence. Their generosity is always appreciated, so thank you to Chase. Also tonight, we are proud to present Governing Board Member Annalena Betia with the ASBA Arizona School Board Association Certificate of Orientation. This certificate is based on her attendance at ASBA activities and is presented by the Board of Directors at ASBA. We want to congratulate her on her good work, even though she is not here today but here in spirit. So we want to show you her certificate that we just received from ASBA. Isn't it beautiful? 
And it's an honor for new members to receive this. So we are so incredibly proud of her, and we will make sure it gets to her immediately. And lastly tonight, we are thrilled to recognize Castro Academy of Fine Arts teacher, Miss Jamie Rayborn, who is at the very back. Jamie, can you stand for us, please? Ah, yes, come forward. Come on up. Jamie is the proud recipient of the Xavier College Preparatory Golden Gator Award of Excellence in Teaching. Cool name, right? Golden Gator? Well, every freshman at Xavier is given the opportunity to nominate one seventh or eighth grade teacher that inspired them, as well as prepared them to enter Xavier. These first year students are called Baby Gators, and that's where the name of the award comes from, obviously. And it is an incredibly high honor for any teacher to receive this and be awarded this. So a certificate was sent to her at her home, but we wanted to honor her in front of all of you. Where is she? There she is. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rayborn, for all of the great work you do, and congratulations on getting this honor. We would love it if you could take a picture with our governing board members. Is that okay? Come on down again. I feel like I'm on the prices right, but come on down. <laughs> Congratulations, Ms. Ms. Rayborn and Castro. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. All right, so our next item is item D, which is our call to the public. Do we have any? All right, we do not have any call to the public. There are no written in comments and there are also no callers waiting. So we're gonna move right past that. And so we're gonna move on to item E, which is our action items. And Dr. Aguilar Lolo. Thank you, Governing Board President, members of the Governing Board, special guests, audience, and our viewers on YouTube. I'm going to introduce our Chief Financial Officer, Victoria Farrar, and she's going to be sharing um, with you an action item and the rationale behind it. Thank you, Victoria. Good evening, President Hernandez, Governing Board members, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, members of the executive and leadership teams and everyone in attendance in person and online. This past legislative session, the legislature added language to statute that affected policy D, J, E, requiring governing boards to approve the audits via a roll call vote. So that means that these are now not on the consent agenda as they had been previously. These are with an individualized roll call vote. This is why it's on an action item as, as opposed to consent and in prior years. Thank you, Victoria. All right, thank you, Victoria. So I would like to make a motion for approval of the 2020-2021 annual financial report, fiscal year 2021 K-3 reading AFR, fiscal year 2022 K-3 reading budget and 15% M&O override expenditures at the Cartwright Elementary School District governing, regular governing board meeting for Thursday, October 14th, 2021. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. So we do have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and a second by governing board member Pedro Lopez. Any discussion? All right, thank you. So we will do a roll call vote. Ms. Lydia Hernandez, how do you vote? Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Governing Board Member, Mr. Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Governing Board Vice President Garcia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. 
I vote aye as well, and the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, so item two is our discussion, information, and action regarding Arizona School Board Association ASBA. Proposed changes to ASBA bylaw article five, section two B, and voting direction to superintendent and or designee. Proposal A, with unanimous approval of the ASBA Hispanic Native American Indian Caucus and endorsement of the ASBA Board of Directors, this change is being sought by the Hispanic Native American Indian Caucus. It would create a seat on the ASBA Board of Directors so that Hispanic and Native American interests can be represented simultaneously on the board. Currently, there is one seat on the ASBA Board of Directors designated for a representative of the HNAIC, and it alternates every two years between Hispanic representation and Native American representation, creating gaps in representation. By contrast, the Black Alliance has a seat on the ASBA Board of Directors, ensuring representation on the board at all times. This proposed bylaw change also provides the flexibility for the HNAIC to split into two distinct groups if its members so choose and allows these groups to change their names and be recognized under the new names. After discussion, the Cartwright School District Governing Board will give direction to Superintendent Dr. Aguilar Luller or her designee, Executive Assistants Christine Santos and Linda Parker, to vote in the manner the board approved. The following rules are set forth in the ASBA bylaws. Each ASB member district board is entitled to one vote on the proposed amendment. The vote must be submitted using the official online form. The decision or vote must be an official governing board action. An affirmative vote of two thirds of ASBA member district boards is necessary for a bylaw amendment to pass. Electronic vote must be received no later than Monday, December 13th, 2021 at 5 p.m. Results will be announced on December 16th, 2021 at the ASBA annual membership meeting. All right, so I'd like to move for approval to give direction to Superintendent Dr. Aguilar Lawler or her designee, Executive Assistants Christine Santos and Linda Parker, to vote yes on the change to ASBA proposed bylaw change to Article 5, Section 2B. Any, dis I'm sorry, do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. So we do have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and a second by Governing Board Member Lydia Hernandez. Any discussion? Go right ahead, Ms. Hernandez. Yes, Madam President, fellow board members, um, Dr. Lawler and executive team, and those um, in the audience and watching. Uh, this is, has been long in coming. It's been a very, very long effort. So I'm glad to see it come to fruition. Uh, the idea that uh, two subgroups of the community statewide would be taking turns uh, at attending and voting on important uh, policy changes throughout Arizona school boards uh, with, I mean, with regard to the entire state and association didn't make sense. So uh, I'm glad that it's here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Any other discussion from the board? Awesome. Thank you. So we'll then we'll go ahead and move on to a roll call vote. Ms. Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Governing Board Lop Member Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. And Vice President Garcia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. I vote aye as well, and the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. So moving on to item three is our second reading for discussion, information, and possible adoption regarding the Arizona School Board Association Policy Advisory, 680-711, volume 33, number three. Recent Arizona School Board Association Policy Advisory 680-711, Volume 33, Number 3, dated July 2021, are policy advisories derived from enactments of the 55th Legislature, First Regular Session, 2021. These are indicated by references to the bills and or statutes which have either been newly created or altered by the Legislature. Several other policy advisories are those which have been revised for clarity by ASBA Policy Services. Policy Advisory 680-711 also includes a policy alert as it relates to House Bill 2898, an amendment to Arizona Revised Statute 35-212. Policy Advisory 687, 704, 708, and 711 were, were reviewed by the District Legal Council. District Legal Council is recommending that the district maintain its current regulation and policy in place given the uncertainty of the most recent court ruling. 
687 GBGB-R, Staff Personal Security and Safety, 704 JICA-RB, Student Dress, 708 JLCB, Immunization of Students, and JLCB-R, Immunization of Students, 711 KI-RB, Visitors to Schools. The administration recommends the governing board maintain current policy in place for policy JLCB, Immunization of Students, the administration will maintain current regulations in place for GBGB-R, Staff Personal Security and Safety, JICA-RB, Student Dress, JLCB-R, Immunizations of Students, and KIRB Visitors to Schools. Regulations are provided to the board for information and review and do not require board approval. So I'd like to make a motion for approval to maintain current district policy in place for Policy Advisory 708, JLCB immunization of students as recommended by district attorney. At the Cartwright Elementary regular Cartwright Elementary School District regular governing board meeting of Thursday, October 14th, 2021. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. So we have a motion made by myself, Ms. Hernandez, and a second by governing board member Pedro Lopez. Any discussion? All right, roll call vote. Ms. Lydia Hernandez, how do you vote? Abstain? Okay. So do you want to do discussion first? Yeah. Okay. This is the time for, we need to do discussion before the vote. Because we have a second and a, mo and a right. motion and a second. Uh -huh. so we continue and, then and then you want to do discussion? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hernandez is abstained. Governing Board Member Lopez? Aye. Thank you. Exactly. I was just mentioning that. There's. I, I'm sorry. It's escaping me right now. But it's. Uh, uh, I just want to move on, not necessarily abstain, and I'm able to do so. Oh, read all of all of this. No. Good. no hold on. Okay, Mr. Lopez was an aye. Vice President Garcia. I vote aye. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. I vote aye as well. Thank you. And now we'll go back to Ms. Hernandez. Term that we can use in, high, in, um, in parliamentary procedures for that, it's escaping me at the moment, but it's just to pass and come back. But um, I, do, I do have a question, and I want to make sure um, – that the current it says that we're going to keep the current immunization policy so there's no change to it regarding requiring any further immunizations you know considering pandemic uh, board president miss hernandez members of the board special guest audience um, absolutely correct we're just going back to the the normal policy that we currently have thank you And that to include my, my vote as aye for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. The board has voted unanimously to approve it. All right, so we will move on to item F, which is a report summary of current events. Dr. Aguilar Lawler. Uh, thank you, Governing Board President, members of the Governing Board, audience, special guest, and our YouTube um, members that are watching. Tonight, we were very excited, Patricia Lopez and I and our team, to present the Tomahawk leadership team they were gonna present um, the fall principal conferences that we've been doing and will continue to do this semester. However, um, Principal Bond is, um, is ill 
and um, she would prefer that um, she could be here with her team to present. So we will be moving this presentation to a future governing board meeting. So I appreciate that. However, we will be um, having a presentation tonight. I'm gonna call uh, Mr. Raul Binya up to um, the microphone and he's going to do another update on our safe and caring schools. Mr. Pena. Can you hear me? Thank you. Good evening, uh, Madam President, Governing Board members, Dr. Leanne Aguilar Lawler, executive team and guests. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we want to come up uh, periodically to give you updates on how we're doing with uh, our safe and caring efforts. I know that uh, goal number three of the Governing Board is uh, social emotional learning. So we want to do that even though it might be a brief uh, presentation we do periodically, but we want you to know that we hear you and that we are very much interested in, in uh, listening to the will of the board and developing this area uh, in our district. So this uh, evening I want to really emphasize the impact of uh, House Bill uh, 2123 that uh, is taking effect this year and what we are doing as a district to uh, bring it into practice and to honor uh, the legislation, but also to look out for our children. Uh, a big uh, piece of how we carry this out is taking into consideration the, the will of the board. And what we've heard you loud and clear is that you want us to look out for children. You want us to take care of children. So we want to do that in light of House Bill 2123. So I'll just highlight a couple of items that are on the screen. And this is uh, super important for us. We want every child in the building or on campus to have a an adult that they feel safe with and also a space they, they where they find safety. Uh, do they have a place, do we have a place to help children de-escalate? Sometimes Monday morning might be a specifically uh, stressful time for a child. They come uh, escalated, stressed, feeling some anxiety. Do they have a place to go to? Do they have a significant adult or an important adult in their lives on, uh, on that campus to go to? I will, uh, you know, celebrate that we have calm spaces at all of our campuses. So that is one very important space. Uh, also, I've seen some classrooms that have their own little calm corner, if you will, and that's another opportunity for a child to go there and feel uh, safe and secure. Some other questions to consider. One is, uh, what is what is happening before, during, and after a suspension? We want to uh, be aware of this because uh, ultimately suspension out of school, research says, it doesn't ultimately help children. Uh, doesn't you know necessarily fix the behavior, uh, but it, it helps them to fall further behind and, and they feel disconnected coming back in some cases. So some things we want to uh, think about before the suspension, does a child have an exit off of the freeway of misbehavior, if you will? So if the, the, the behavior is being caused by anxiety or stress, do they have an opportunity to exit that freeway before they get into uh, the consequence realm, if you will. Uh, during a suspension, if a child is uh, ultimately suspended and we follow the policy, uh, what's happening? Are the parents aware the child is home? Are they safe? Uh, and we want to make sure that that is uh, definitely uh, a safe situation at home. And after, what happens after uh, we are, uh, through our Boys Town training, there is a restorative piece already, and we want to develop that and further enhance those opportunities. So after the suspension, uh, students return, and there's a way to restore that relationship, not only with the teacher, their peers, and, and the, um, the adult staff as well. Um, Due process, we want to make sure every child has an opportunity to tell their side of the story. A child's voice is super important. A parent's voice is important, absolutely. And also a child uh, should have the opportunity for due process, just like all of us do, to say this is what happened, this is my, my side of the story. Um, I'll give you one example of a restorative practice when, when a child comes back from a suspension or even, you know, a, a a lesser consequence, if you will. 
Uh, the restorative piece is very important in one way that sounds simple, but it's important, it's critical to us. We're asking, um, we're asking staff to, to greet the students every morning. So if I had a, a tough day yesterday afternoon and I'm a second grader and I had a consequence, the next day when my teacher sees me, smiles at me, maybe a fist bump or a high five, that in itself is a way to restore that relationship, if you will. It, it, it signifies to me as a second grader, that is forgotten. What happened yesterday happened, it was unfortunate, but now my teacher, uh, I'm able to restore my, my relationship. Some uh, key communication uh, that we've had with uh, our school teams and Predominantly, we're working with our assistant principals, but principals are, are receiving uh, this information. So we do, we do present at, at uh, admin team. Tomorrow I have a, a training with assistant principals specifically on House Bill 2123, how we are uh, implementing the House Bill here in Cartwright. And so we have, you know, multiple documents that, that are going, uh, let's see, that are going home, or not going home, going to schools. So we have behavior checklists. These are some things for you to consider. What are the interventions that are in place? What is, the, what is your procedure for documenting the intervention? How are we reaching parents and so forth? Um, the other piece that has been very useful for us is a document we call the roles and responsibilities uh, document. And in those columns, what we find is that each key player on that support team has uh, the roles and responsibilities outlined. There are some roles that overlap and some functions that do overlap, but essentially what we can uh, guarantee with, with a high degree of confidence is that there is a team looking out for that child uh, through, through the items on the columns, the duties, the responsibilities in those columns. Um, and we're also, you know, we're going to continue to provide uh, supporting documents on House Bill 2123. Uh, we re recently received a document from our attorney. We'll be sharing that flow chart tomorrow, which is, uh, again, absolutely important for our assistant principals to know and, and be aware. I will highlight some key words in this particular paragraph. Um, and the House Bill... Uh, there is a provision in the House bill where the children, uh, in order to be suspended out of school, need to be seven years or older. And that's, quite frankly, tested our system because we really have to react to, differently to four, five, and six-year-old children who just haven't been in school. So the truth is it's created uh, stress in our system. It's created some uh, uh, new learning opportunities, if you will. But what the House bill also has done is put in place uh, some safety nets to ensure that we have interventions in place for students that are, are potentially going to be suspended out of school. So the flip side of, of the, uh, the challenges is that now in, in, the, in the legislation we have uh, some provisions in place to look out for children. And, and even in this paragraph it says, uh, you know, it, it outlines, did we provide an intervention with specifically a school counselor, a psychologist, a social worker, and other mental health uh, professionals? I'll point out a couple of items here, and I'll start at the top with our McKinney-Vento uh, students. We want to take into consideration, is, is a child facing a suspension do they have special protections? And I'll, one example is if a child is impacted by uh, facing the challenge of temporary uh, displacement, uh, do they have a safe place to go during a suspension? Suspension may work at the moment for the school, but it may not work for the parent or the family. And part of our responsibility is to take into consideration, will they be safe during that suspension, if you will? Uh, of course, IP accommodations, 504 plans, those are some other special protections that we would uh, consider as well. I'll, I'll move to item, bullet item number four, and this is something that is, is practical and important 
are we aware of any recent changes in the family? The child has had good behavior, positive behavior, and all of a sudden they're misbehaving. It's not as simple as, you know, they chose to misbehave today. There could be something else. And our, our job, our responsibility is to find out what is that uh, something else. It could be trauma. It could be illness. It could be, you know, changes in the, the family structure. And it's our responsibility to, to look into that. Uh, the last item I'll, I'll mention in this slide is that we really want to uh, connect the, the term at Care Celeste is a warm ha handoff, if you will. We want to do, uh, be engaged in that process to make a warm handoff between the counselor, the social worker, and the family and the agency. So we want to facilitate that because, as you know, our families are facing some, some challenges due to COVID and uh, economics and so forth. But we want to uh, be a bridge for that, and we also want to be key communicators in this idea that mental health is like our physical health, and we want to model that and promote that and say, you know, if you need help, uh, it, it's, a, it's a phone call away, if you will. So that's a big, important piece for us in, uh, in terms of special considerations and uh, in the House Bill 2123. So... This is my, my brief update. I just, I'm glad to check in with you and let you know that we are still working and doing our very best to help our children. I would be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Pena. Questions? Ms. Garcia? Thank you for that presentation, Mr. Pena. Um, Dr. Aguilar Lawler. Madam President, fellow members of the board, everyone in attendance, two things. Uh, you mentioned suspensions quite a bit, and I know we've discussed that for several years. So what type of behaviors would warrant a suspension? And you also mentioned that um, the, the lines of communication would, of course, are always encouraged to know or to make sure that the families are aware of the suspension. But that would be something that's automatic, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's not a, a question or a wonder. That mm -hmm. is in stone that the families would know that. Yes, ma'am. Um, and then secondly, regarding the, the supports. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I am aware that we are aware that we do have a support system mm -hmm. when it comes to um, behavior modification, if you will. Mm -hmm. And also with that, it brings me to wonder how RISE is doing with the behavioral supports. Are we in fact staffed at the, I believe it's Estrella and, don't, and uh, Heather Bray, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So um, I'm not sure what the numbers look like, how many scholars we have in the classrooms. And I think you had mentioned, well, I, I'm not even sure how many classroom settings, how many classrooms are there? And is the, what does the ratio look like? And within the classroom settings to address our special needs, our, our RISE scholars, what does the, uh, the support system look like? Are, are we fully staffed to support them? as well as uh, the behavior modification. What does that look like? And I did see the IEPs, of course, and I'm assuming that they all have an IEP. And you had mentioned previously in a previous presentation about trying to work with them to implement, well, put them back into the mainstream setting, which is excellent. I don't know, I mean, all, all of our scholars are different and all their needs are different, but I, I guess my, my main questions would be the support system that's there mm -hmm. and the ratio, the numbers, what does that look like, as well as the, uh, yeah, just the suspension, what would warrant the suspensions? Thank you, Mrs. Garcia. Madam President, uh, governing board members, Dr. Aguilar Lawler and guests, uh, thank you for the, for the question. So the House bill is, is heavy on the suspensions, um, suspensions in general, but specifically there's some uh, a special attention to long-term suspensions, right? And it talks about aggravating, uh, aggravating circumstances, and it talks about 
weapons and uh, aggression. It talks about disrupting the school environment. So those are some of the, the key pieces that warrant the suspensions. We are obviously doing our best to minimize that. Uh, but there, according to the, the House bill and, and these things, in some instances do come up, there are incidents of aggression where a student has to be suspended, and we might at some point consider long-term suspension even uh, because the, uh, the, uh, the violence or the aggression might be that uh, serious. So those are the types of incidents that would require a long-term suspension, if you will. Uh, in the matrix, there is provisions for suspensions for, for fighting or for those type of things, short term. But when we talk about longer term, it would be a serious injury as a result of aggression, those types of things. A serious injury to me would not um, warrant a suspension. Mm -hmm. That would be more like something having to do with the me mm -hmm. medically fragile mm -hmm. scholar, mm -hmm. you know. So. Speaking to the long-term suspension, again, for several years we've discussed what that would look like and that the objective is to keep them in school mm -hmm. because, of course, as you so eloquently conveyed, if they're not in school, then they are not learning. Mm -hmm. So what a disservice, right? Mm -hmm. So um, with that, maybe we can discuss at some point, and I'll, I'll bring it up at future agenda items, what would that look like? How can we help our scholars to remain in a school setting where they can continue to thrive educationally. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once again, the support system, I'm curious about RISE because I do know we have supports in place. I just don't know if the ratio makes sense, mm -hmm. if we're in compliance. Thank you, Thank Mrs. You. Garcia. Madam President, governing board members, Dr. Aguilar Lawler and executive team. Uh, a couple of things that the, our governing board has done under the leadership of Dr. Lawler is uh, we have sent a very uh, clear message to our, our children and families that those, even the, the children who are uh, facing a long-term suspension, even an expulsion, what we've done, and I've been here for that, is we have redirected those children to formerly AFS and now currently RISE. So uh, in some states or some districts, Students are home without the, that opportunity. Something that you know you should feel proud of, and I'm proud of certainly, is that we redirect those children to a rise or to an AFS uh, formally. Um, in terms of the ratio uh, at Heather Bay, I'll tell you that we have uh, three classrooms there now, and a big big focus on on peer students. Uh, so there are some very uh, at this point, all of the students that are there have an IEP. They're they're peer students. Uh, some some intense needs. The ratio is is a uh, is is workable, but Rise is also facing some of the challenges we're facing throughout the state and country in terms of finding staff. So we are short a couple of people. Uh, two techs, for example. Uh, we have a couple of teachers who are emergency certified. So we're facing some of the the same challenges, uh, but we've been able to to maintain redirect. Uh, human resources to, to make it work. If we could find more people, we would be in a much better place, definitely, definitely. I appreciate that, mm -hmm. thank you. And yes, you, you are absolutely correct. We mm -hmm. do need more staff and more people. Um, I appreciate that, thank you. And finally, I think um, I will save the rest of my questions. Maybe we can discuss later. Uh, but great, great presentation, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Garcia. Thank you. I have a clarifying question really quick. Um, fellow governing board members, Dr. aguilar Lawler, cabinet, um, everyone in attendance, for you. So when you said serious injury doesn't warrant a suspension, and then you said something about medically fragile, can you clarify that? Because my understanding in that conversation would be the serious injury would be to a different student, and the student that caused the serious, mm -hmm. maybe I'm getting this wrong, the student that caused the serious injury would then have to face a consequence. But that's not what it sounded like in your, like, no, I comment. appreciate your question. Okay, for clarification, when I think of suspensions, I think something, a, a behavior, mm -hmm. a behavior that has become intense to where the child or the scholar must be, um, 
removed from the school setting for a time being. But as er, during the presentation, um, a statement was that, or, or that a, an illness was also pointed out for a suspension, but the two are two separate entities. So for someone to be at home because they're ill would not constitute or a, a suspension. So medically fragile would be someone who is medically fragile, whether they are um, had surgery, perhaps, or long-term uh, illness, God forbid, you know, um, terminal illness or something to that effect, or, or for a scholar who is uh, in so severely um, mentally and or physically unable to help themselves. That would be medically fragile to me. Thank okay, you. thank you. I totally took it out of context. Thank you. I was thinking if another, if a student injured another student, that wasn't warranting suspension, but right. totally thank you for clarifying it. Um, I did have a question though. Thank you, Ms. Yes, Garcia. Madam President. So when we say the word suspensions, yes. do we mean actually they're out of school or are they being deferred into the RISE program? At, at this time, they're out of school. That would be an out of school suspension. Uh, we do not have the staffing at this moment. We hired a new staff member just this week to try to accommodate some of the shorter term placements, but we just have not had the staffing to do that. So it's out of school suspensions for now. The short term, if there was a long term situation, then we would find a way to accommodate that child at rise, if you will. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pena. Um, just real quick before we move on to you, Ms. Garcia, um, during the future agenda items, I think it would be good to get a quarterly update on the amount of suspensions that we currently, have, like each quarter, um, to include but not limited to, and, and I'll send it in. I'll email it to you, Christine. Um, like the type of instances, um, the grade levels, the terms of the suspension, gender. We don't need any other personally identifying information, like student names, none of that. Um, but if we could kind of see like what the trends are in the data, what's, what's actually happening, and we can get a better understanding, um, I think that'd be good, but I'll ask for it at the future agenda items. I don't expect you to present that right now, Mr. Pena. Yes, yes. But it would be a good idea as kind of a standard so that we can really understand what's, mm -hmm. what's occurring and Absolutely. you know what we truly need. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Your turn. Would you mind also including what does short term and long term look like? What are the time frames? Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, Mrs. Garcia, thank you. Board, board president, members of the governing board audience, uh, Mr. Pena, special guests. Um, I can include, uh, Veronica, if you don't mind, in the board bulletin tomorrow, a copy of the discipline matrix that actually tells you um, what the suspension would be, like for number of days to you know minimum, maximum. So at least that's a starting point um, for all of you. So we'll do that. Thank you, Dr. Long. Any other questions? Oh, Ms. Hernandez. Yes, Madam President, fellow board members, uh, executive team. Um, the 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 protections are great, I, I think. But we, I mean, I think, and this is for why I say this, is that, again, we've been evolving, mm -hmm. and it's great to be having this discussion. It's great that the state has taken the lead and, and offered uh, some legal language so that we can, in turn, um, you know, implement at our level. However, I'm sitting here going, still thinking, yeah, we were, we've been discussing this, you know, many, many years ago, and I understand it's evolving. And now we've got some some guidelines, which are great, except, um, and I think our policy remains the same in terms of our um, approved upon, I'm going to say, um, suspension policy. You know, for the same, I can more or less tell you, you know, what, what that is. You know, a fight, somebody's injured, police officer involved, things like that. The restorative justice for me steps would look like uh, that instead, as you were mentioning, instead of instead of um, uh, expulsing, 
that we would take uh, the constructive action. And so when I see these protections, that's that follow-up. However, if the if our policy matrix is still the same and hasn't been tweaked, it is where we where we need to be tweaking because it's the policy that dictates who, when, and where is going to be expelled. However, right now I'm also listening and hearing that because of the times that we're going through, uh, that's not realistic. So I think because of the the shortness. I mean, it, let's say we do have those. We do, we do have situations where we have people uh, or, you know, our scholars that are warrant perhaps suspensions. I'm going to begin with the most mild, the, the suspensions, not expulsions. Um, and if we are having those and we're dealing with it, we continue to deal with it the way we, the way the policy dictates, then this, I'm, I'm thinking, when are we going to get to actually implement this? And we're not going to be able to unless we have the staff to be able to, to, uh, to intervene. So I would recommend uh, it's not just about the numbers. Uh, if we're currently having that, I think we need to be taking action now because I could be listening to the protections for a few more years and, and be wishful upon it, but if we don't take action with uh, one within the policy not to expel and change that current expulsion that we have uh, policy so that we can, and uh, coupled with perhaps, you know, the support of, of uh, of a staff. I'm going to say a staff. I don't know if we, you know, uh, difficult to go beyond that, but I think um, I was kind of getting confused, I think, with the medical, but I'm just thinking mm -hmm. suspensions uh, at this point. But but I'm with you on following up. It's just that I, I'd like to for us to review that policy once again. I think we reviewed it several times over the past few years, but to really, with a different focus, now that we've got more information, because that piece was not there. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. We can request it at the future agenda items. So let's just remember that there's a few things that we're going to be asking for. If we can all just work together at the future agenda items to make sure we stay on task with all the things that we're asking for. I did write it down. That's a great idea. Um, sorry, it's not my turn. It's Mr. Lopez. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow executive team, fellow board members, and those in the audience. Mr. Pina, thank you for the update and presentation. A uh, question that I had with the staffing issue, are, are you aware of the challenges that we're facing? Is it a skilled workforce that we can't find? Um, is it a you know pay issue, advertising? Um, because if you know we now have more guidance from the state and as mentioned by Board Member Hernandez, we've revised our policy in the past and I think now we can really get to solve you know, some of these challenges, but if we don't have the staff um, to accomplish it, you know, it's going to be challenging to really move towards the right direction. So my, my question or my concern is, you know, wh what's the issue with the hiring process and have we identified uh, a solution to put in place to reduce the gap that we have in that department? Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Uh, Madam President, Governing Board Members, Dr. Aguilar Lawler and executive team and guests, uh, great question and great point. And in the, what we are facing in Cartwright is, is happening all over the country, as you know, the staffing shortage. Uh, teaching is just a very challenging uh, career field. I mean, it's a calling. It's a very challenging career field to be in. So we're facing that. Uh, the people, uh, the folks at uh, RISE, doing this work, peer program, LFI, these are special people that are, are harder and harder to find, more difficult to find because uh, the needs are so intense. So absolutely our human resources is, you know, all over uh, all over the country using every resource they can to find those folks. We have uh, been in, a, in an okay place because we've, uh, even some of our own ESPs have stepped forward and gone through the emergency certification process. We've been able to find key people that want to do that work specifically, so we've been able to do uh, fine. But you're right, in order to expand the program and reach more children, more scholars that need us, we would need to absolutely ramp, ramp that up. So uh, we're, we're in the same boat as everyone else. I think we're, we're doing okay with the staff we have, but we can definitely use more to expand our work. But thank you for the question. Thank you. No mm -hmm. other questions, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Um, 
board president, members of the governing board, uh, Mr. Pena, audience, and um, our special guests and those watching, um, we definitely need to think out of the box because we understand that staffing is not going to all of a sudden happen. Mm -hmm. There are just no people um, that are applying, and even those that are, we do want the best. The teachers um, at RISE and throughout the district are just doing incredible things. And so we are talking right now about some potential ideas to be able to ensure we have a caring adult and efficient and effective and uh, teachers that can work through a lot of the issues that are students that are going to rise, whether it's temporary or longer. We just had a conversation on Tuesday with the leadership team. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, our principals are the next stage of you know the ideas only can come to fruition with that with their support. So we do know that we have to do something different because it's not going to change that we have this shortage. So we have to do something different with what we have internally. And so we are working on that. And I do look forward to bringing those updates um, to the governing board in the near future. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aguilar Lawler. Any other questions from the governing board? Thank you, Mr. Pena. Great job. Thank you. Thank you for all you do to support our you students. Know what? I'm sorry, Madam President. I, I do have a follow up question really quick before I'm going to be thinking about it later. If I don't ask it, sorry, Mr. Pena. I, it has to do with the. Um, could you give us um, an idea? Um, in terms of working with the principals, in terms of staff motivation, acceptance, understanding the trainings that have been implemented or have or have not uh, in and around what restorative justice actions look like when it comes to student disciplinary actions. Uh, and again, I'm mindful that I have the same, that we have the same uh, uh, policy. But is there, um, is there a recognition in that? Because I know, I, I mean, I, I've been involved many, many, many years, had kids here myself, and it's a very simple difference between uh, being the teacher in that, in that capacity, having a, a student that's misbehaving, and I know this one's going to be misbehaving again. And instead, instead of me, you know, understanding, I mean, I'm, I'm human, and um, being short, get out of here I'm going to send you to the principal it happens as simple as that um, as taking a step back and are those are there supports in place or in lieu of additional staff to deal directly with this do we uh, how is that training being accepted not accepted what does it look like throughout the district uh, thank you Mr. Chinanis uh, Madam President Governing Board Members Dr. Aguilar Lawler executive team great question and there are some, some pieces already embedded in our Boys Town and PBIS. There's some restorative pieces, there's some uh, bridge building pieces, there's some relationship building pieces there already. Praise to correction ratio is something we talk about uh, constantly. If you praise a student, they're more likely to, to connect and engage, right? Uh, class meetings, uh, greeting at the door, those are, uh, may not sound immediately like restorative pieces, but they are, they're, they're uh, we're, we're going to the, to the next level with, with clowns, counselors, SEL, and having conversations. There's, I mean, for example, uh, uh, at RISE, we do some deliberate uh, conversations with a staff member, a behavior tech, who you know, had a difficult day yesterday, and there is a conversation about what happened, what triggered that uh, you know, misunderstanding or what have you, and, and they're able to restore that relationship. So I think we're on that journey. We have a solid foundation with PBIS and Boys Town. Our teachers are excellent, and I also want to say that our teachers are, are stretched. So, I mean, just like everyone else, because of staffing, because of COVID, because of, you know, the challenges, you know, we're, we're all human. So I think uh, it's important that we not only follow the training that we have, but also lean on each other, if you will, as principals, as uh, leaders, as teachers. It's, it's more important than ever to come together as a community for that reason. It's just, it's a very stressful time, but we're in this together. There is that sense. Thank you, Mr. Pena. I'd like to add to that. Um, board President, Ms. Hernandez, members of the board, 
To answer your question, in the last uh, two years, we have added a district social workers. We call them um, social emotional learning specialists. We've added a counselor to every school. We've added response to intervention behavior specialists with our certified teachers to actually work on implementing Boys Town and PBIS positive um, behaviors. We also have a new position called the Safe and Caring Team Member, which is an ESP at our middle schools and our k 8 that's a caring adult. And the other thing that we're very proud of is every school now has a safe space so that it's not go to the principal's office. It's a place, place where they can go, regulate, take a time out. And we've been to some of the, the schools and we've gone in there and we've seen our scholars sitting there taking deep breaths, reading a book. And so we have done all that. What uh, Mr. Pena so eloquently stated is that now the training and the professional development and the, the understanding and communication about all of those things that we've now hired thanks to our governing board for approving all that and um, being able to reallocate resources because we don't have extra resources to what the need of the district is. And once I think everybody understands how those things work, and I know Tomahawk School, when they do the principal evaluation updates, they do speak to how um, they have a, the person that works on the behaviors and how that all comes to play so that those children are also successful. Because you're right, it is very challenging, but we have put in a lot of different people into the schools to help, in addition to RISE. And so we have a lot more support in the last couple of years, and we need it. And so we just have to get better with using it and understanding the system and communicating it. I hope that helps. Yes. Sorry, and then I'm thinking about our substitute. Uh, incorporating that into the fold and you know what's being done I think to in to incorporate the the substitutes uh, with this um, with what we're calling the restorative justice and the changes that what that looks like for them Excellent. and we may not be used to them and coming into a different and I know that I know we've got a lot of challenges it's just like to get a tone for that acceptance and, and including including I think from that sub, those substitutes see what, we're, see what we're hearing back but thank you excellent question thank you for your point thank you mr. Pena thank you, thank you mr. Hernandez <laughs> thank you these are uh, great questions that are being brought up and uh, dr. Aguilar Lawler madam president fellow board members everyone in attendance so as I think about all of this discussion which is so extremely important uh, two questions one is and you, you don't have to get you don't have to tell me now uh, or tell uh, let us know now but the suspensions are the for those that are short-term and long-term scholars that are suspended are they receiving packets homework packets I'm going to assume they are and are they getting or receiving check-in calls from the teachers uh, SELs and all these people to keep them connected Mrs. Garcia, thank you for your question. Uh, Madam President, Governing Board members, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, and executive team. So I'm, I'm confident about the academic pieces. Uh, I, I want to assume that yes, there's follow-up, but I can't tell you in, with certainty that it happens in every instance. Uh, but there is you know, the homework packet, there is the, uh, the follow-up, because the academics doesn't stop. We want you to keep working. Uh, but I can, I can tell you that with confidence, because I've, I've seen it. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Pena. I appreciate you coming back and answering further questions. <laughs> Thank you, um, board president, members of the governing board, um, audience, special guests. I just want to um, start off by saying Welcome back, everybody. Um, I was talking to President Michella uh, earlier today, and I said, was October break last week already? Um, but I really sincerely hope everyone was able to enjoy some peace and rest and are ready for the second quarter. It really has been great to see everyone, especially tonight. 
And for those of you watching, thank you for all you do and all your hard work. This past Monday, we had our October Parent Advisory Council meeting. It's kind of interesting about the conversation that we're having right now based on our parents. Um, I wanted to give a huge thank you and shout out to this amazing group of parent advocates and leaders. This particular meeting, we focused on special education processes, needs, next steps for training our ESPs, and how to best work with students with special needs. But the parents also brought up a very huge concern um, and that was uh, what they're seeing with social media, the TikTok challenges, and they requested that we at the district start sending daily messaging to the families of our parents and our scholars. They really want parents and families to talk to their children about social media. They want their children to know, they want to know what their children are doing on social media, and they want them to know how dangerous and that they can get into a lot of serious trouble by following these inappropriate and illegal activities. I am very proud of our parent group because they are not blaming the schools. They are thanking our principals and our teachers and our ESPs and they are saying we want to help. We believe as parents that we're part of the solution. And I want to thank President Laura Martinez and all the parents who represent our schools on PAC. Thank you for being part of our solutions. And um, we will continue, as you know, if you have children here, you're going to be receiving daily messages. And I thank our communication teams and our principals. Mr. Chandler, you know, we talked yesterday. Um, they're helping us with the message and we will ensure that um, our children know that we care about them and that they need to be safe and that we need the, the parents and families to help us with that. On a positive note as well, I would like to congratulate Holiday Park second grade teacher Amanda Delphi. She's going to be recognized by the Arizona Secretary of State's office as one of 14 outstanding nominees for the state's inaugural John Lewis Youth Leadership Award. I know. This award was created as an initiative by the National Association of Secretaries of States to honor the life and achievements of the late Congressman John Lewis and aims to inspire Americans by awarding a civic-minded young person in each state who exemplifies public service and advocacy for civil rights, the recipient should demonstrate leadership abilities, have a passion for social justice, and be motivated to improve the quality of life in their community. The Arizona Secretary of State's office will announce the awardee Tuesday, September 28th, which passed, in celebration of National Voter Registration Day. Congratulations to our amazing teacher. That's incredible. Also another celebration this past September, Jonathan Nash, that last name sounds familiar, a former Tomahawk student was one of six students selected to be part of a roundtable discussion with Vice President Kamala Harris when she visited Hampton University. Her visit was to recognize minorities in STEM fields and how their contributions impact the future success of our nation's workforce. Jonathan Nash is a junior studying marine biology and environmental studies. Great job, Jonathan Nash. You make us so proud. And yes, his mother is the great Vivian Nash, uh, principal of Glenel Down Social Science Academy. Congratulations, Jonathan, and your family. And finally, there's been a lot of talk about governing boards the last couple of years and all they've had to endure. And on behalf of the Cartwright School District teachers, principals, community, parents, my team, uh, we would just like to say thank you for being here, um, supporting us through this pandemic and all the things that um, come up that we don't know are gonna come up. We're learning but we're working together and I'm very proud of this community. 
Um, I'm very proud of, of my team that's sitting here. They work so hard every day, and our principals, our ESPs, and our teachers. So thank you again for all you do. Um, please know we do not take you for granted. We appreciate you so much. So thank you. That concludes my update. Thank you, everyone. All right, so we'll move on to item G, which is our consent agenda. Dr. Aguilar Luller. Board President, members of the governing board, the administration recommends approval of the consent agenda as presented. Thank you. So I'd like to make a motion that we approve tonight's consent agenda as presented at the Cartwright Elementary School District regular governing board meeting of October 14th, 2021. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. We do have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and a second by governing board member Pedro Lopez. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Ms. Lydia Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Governing board member Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Vice President Garcia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Garcia, and I vote as well, and the motion carries. I'd like to say congratulations to Mr. Alex Amada, who is our new Director of Transportation. Yay, Alex. I know you're watching. Board President, members of the Governing Board, um, I would like to um, ask uh, uh, Dr. Medrano to come forward um, to talk about the standing item, COVID-19 mitigation and future planning updates. Dr. Medrano. Thank you, Dr. Lawler. Um, Madam President, governing board members, executive team members, special guests, and audience in attendance. Um, I'm happy to be able to report this evening and give an update in regards to our community transmission uh, metrics around COVID and our continued uh, vigilance with implementing our variety of um, mitigation strategies to make sure that we're keeping our, our students, our, our scholars, our teachers, our staff, and our community safe. So over the last two weeks, um, we have seen some promising trends where um, the case, the number of cases <laughs> per 100,000 people across our three uh, zip codes is concerned. Uh, we went in the last two weeks, and this, this particular data here is as recent as uh, today. We have gone from 198, a little over 198 cases per 100,000 people to 141 as of this week. Um, mm -hmm. Our percent positivity rates um, those are still increasing a little bit. Um, that, is, that has gone up in the last two weeks. From, over the past couple of weeks, we went from um, two measurements ago from about 17% to 18.8, .8, so just under 19. And in, uh, as of today, we, we're showing a 23% uh, positivity rate. So while we're seeing a, a, a pretty um, significant decline in the cases per 100,000 percent positivity is still um, not going in the direction where we would like to see it at this time. Um, we're also continuing to carefully monitor the percentage of our community that is getting vaccinated, both as a whole, as an entire community across the th the, uh, our three zip codes, and then also our zero to 14 uh, year, old, year old age group that comprises our scholars. Um, as uh, for our um, Overall vaccination percentages in our 85031 zip code since September 15th to, to as of um, the measurements today, we've seen an increase from 45.1% of our community having gotten at least one dose of a vaccination to now 50.9%. Um, that The 50.9 has held over the past two measurements, so I don't know if that's because it's stagnant or today's numbers just aren't yet updated, so we'll, we'll continue to monitor that. Um, within our, our zip code 85033, since September 15th, we've seen an increase in vaccination rates from 43.9% to 49.4%, so just a shade under 50%. And in our zip code 85035, we've also seen an increase from 43.7% to 49.3%. So across 
all of our three zip codes were getting right, right around to the 50% uh, mark. So the, the um, efforts that have been taking place over the last two months between uh, our Phoenix Union partners and the many opportunities that are offered there, the, uh, our partnership with the Maricopa County Department of Public Health and being able to offer some vaccination opportunities over at Atkinson, uh, I think these combined efforts are starting to, you know, edging us towards where we want to get to, where, you know, those, those uh, hopefully percentages of 70 and 80 percentages of our community being vaccinated because we know that's the number one way to be able to protect our scholars and our community overall is um, getting as many eligible individuals vaccinated as possible. For our scholars, or our, our, stu our community members that are between um, zero to 14 years of age, um, because we don't have a large eligibility, a, a large number of uh, children who are eligible to receive a vaccine yet, um, these numbers are increasing a little bit, um, a little bit more modestly. In our 85031 um, zip code, we've seen an increase um, from the last time we presented to now of eight, from 8.3 percent to 8.8 percent. In our 85033 zip code, it's gone from 7.61 percent to 8.38%. And in our 85035 zip code, it's gone from 7.57% vaccination rates to 8.08%, 8 .08%, excuse me, sorry. So in terms of continuing to make sure that we're keeping our scholars and our, our, our teachers, staff, and community members safe, we're, we're just continuing to be very vigilant and consistent with our, our wide variety of, of mitigation strategies that we have in place. So um, thanks to your support, we're able to continue to, uh, move, to move forward with our, uh, man, our uh, mass mandate and across our schools. Um, everybody's being real good about adhering, adhering to, um, to the requirement and making sure we're keeping one another safe in particular when indoors. Um, the physical distancing, so continuing to just constantly reinforce that message, the importance of being physically distanced indoors and even outdoors when within close proximity, the importance of that. Um, we're continuing with our um, sanitizing and disinfection routines within our classroom um, every Friday, making sure we're doing deep cleanings on our bus routes, making sure that the part of the post-check post, the post -check activities is, is cleaning up, clean, uh, Cleaning down the bus, the bus seats after uh, after the students have exited, and we're done with the with the bus run. And then on Fridays, doing a more extensive cleaning of our of our buses as well. Um, we're continuing to uh, focus and implement on our um, improvement of air quality within the classrooms. So we have our air purification systems in our buses. Um, we have the bipolar ionization technologies that is installed on all of our units, both the new replacements as well as our old units that are still waiting to be replaced as of now, um, continuing to just consistently message the importance of hand um, washing hands, using hand sanitizer, uh, going across the schools and seeing that, that that's readily available in our cafeterias and in our classrooms, and providing guidance for extracurricular activities. So for our sports teams, you know, just making sure we're not on the playing field, continuing to have a mask affixed, even, even within outdoor sports. Um, limiting spectators to two, fam two family members per athlete. So just continuing to operate uh, in a way that's, um, that's cautious and that's making sure that we're doing our part to see these uh, community transition metrics continue to, to stay on the decline where we want to see it, see it going. With um, vaccination activities, we are, uh, like I had mentioned, through our partnership with the uh, Maricopa County Department of Public Health, we are going to be offering another um, COVID vaccination opportunity on Friday, November the 5th from 1 to 7 p.m. and also on Saturday, November the 6th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, this is going to be taking place at John F. Long Elementary School to coincide with our uh, Phoenix Food Day and Health Fest on Saturday, November 6th. So we're hoping that our parents who and community members who come through the drive through event will make a quick right and left and stop over at Long if they have not yet received their vaccination. Um, in addition to the COVID-19 uh, vaccinations, we will also be offering, uh, Maricopa will be offering as well the child, uh, childhood immunizations, uh, the required immunizations that are needed for, uh, for school enrollment, uh, the, the flu vaccine, and also the COVID uh, booster for individuals whose, or whose original vac vaccine was the uh, Pfizer vaccine. 
And so anybody that would come in for a um, booster, they have to be um, 18 years or older. Has to, it has to have been at least six months since their last, uh, or since their original uh, COVID uh, vaccination, and they would have to present their um, CDC card just showing that they had received that uh, Pfizer vaccination. So we are looking forward um, to that opportunity to continue to contribute to the efforts of, of helping our community continue to get uh, vaccinated. And we continue to have our reporting group. Um, so as, as cases are reported to us of, of positive cases or um, students that are demonstrating symptoms, um, those cases are reported to our COVID reporting group for um, a timely response to provide guidance on whether or not a, um, the need to quarantine will be necessary and, and possible exposure letters to families. So I'm just continuing to be vigilant in our responses to that and making sure that we're keeping a a safe environment across all of our schools. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and open it up to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Medrano. Before I open it up to the governing board, I have a quick question. On the um, percent positive, I missed the percentage. Can you, can you state that one more time, please? Sure, absolutely. It was like in the very beginning. Okay. Yes, so our percent positivity over the last two weeks have gone from 18.84% up to 23.21%. Okay, thank you. And then um, questions from the governing board? Okay, I have a question. Um, fellow governing board members, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, cabinet members, very special guests and dignitaries, and everyone in the audience and viewing with us on Zoom this evening. The school immunizations, and I'm sorry, was that, did you say that was November 5th and 6th? Yes, it'll be on November 5th and 6th. And then my question for that one is, undocumented, it doesn't, they can still get immunizations? Like yes. if a child is undocumented, can they still come in and re they don't ask? Okay. Yes, no, that, that's not anything that's okay. asked. Just from wanted me. to make sure. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. That was it. I just wanted to clarify that part because I know that's really important, being able to get, um, well, definitely COVID's important too and the update, the mitigation plan, but also for our parents to be able to get immunizations for their s students as well. So I just wanted to make sure I clarified that. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Medrano. Um, I was talking, just kidding. Go ahead, Ms. Garcia. I'm totally joking. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members. My question is very simple. The, the That was a good question about uh, the immunizations. Are they open to the entire community, which will include undocumented as well? So to be able to ask that question specifically, um, do you, are you, I mean, do you have any vac are you, have you been vaccinated? Is, um, is, does that fall under the HIPAA protection? I'm sorry, Ms. Garcia, if you, if you can clarify, I just want to oh, make sure. sure I'm understanding the question correctly. Because I realize that HIPAA is big. So anything that is conveyed that will divulge uh, medical, medical, I guess. So board president, members of the governing board, um, we HIPAA is in regards to giving medical information out that protects, but the childhood immunization is a state statute that children that come to school have to be vaccinated with certain vaccines, but it's not the COVID vaccine. It's just the childhood to come to school. And unfortunately, we have a lot of, because of COVID, a lot of our families were unable to go get those uh, immunizations. So we're hoping, and Dr. Madrano and his team's gonna be sending letters home to the families who uh, have been tagged. You can't come to school if you're not vaccinated. And so we're hoping to capture the majority of our scholars during those two days uh, for parents who know they can just come and, and bring their shot records and or not get their shot records, they can still have documentation to the school nurses so they can go to school. I appreciate that, thank you. And just knowing that it's open to our entire community, regardless of 
their legal status is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome, Ms. Garcia. Thank you for the question, Ms. Garcia. Um, and thank you for clarifying, Dr. aguilar Luller. No, it wouldn't be a violation of HIPAA. Um, since they would be coming in to get immunizations, they'd have to know how many they've had, if any. But it's definitely a good question to ask because, I mean, we run into people and we know people that are, sometimes they have no clue what to do. They have no idea, like, how do I get immunizations? And so we're helping and trying to connect them to resources. So this is a great resource to be able to provide them to so that they can go and get their, just like uh, Ms. Garcia and Dr. aguilar Lawler said, so they can get access to those things. So this is great. Thank you. Yes, now we're um, having this uh, partnership with Maricopa, it's for the entire school year, so we'll definitely be uh, continuing to partner with them to offer several more opportunities throughout the year. Awesome, thank you. Definitely appreciated. I think that ends our questions. Thank you, Dr. Madrano. Did one of our reps raise their hand? Anybody? Okay, just checking, thank you. So we're gonna go back to, we're gonna move on to item number two, which is Ms. Veronica Sanchez. Good evening again, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, governing board members, executive team, and our viewing audience, as well as those that are here in attendance. I just wanted to give you a brief overview of our plans for a COVID-19 memorial. I've mentioned this before in the past, but I wanted to give you an update on what our department is currently working on. We are partnering with Chase, if you recall, to erect the memorial in the governing board entrance uh, of the district office, and it will be adorned with flowers and foliage, so it will be very beautiful. You will be getting an invitation for the event sometime next week, scheduled tentatively for Friday, November 5th in the morning, and we'd love it if uh, Governing Board President Maris Hernandez would say a few words uh, during that memorial, as well as the rest of board members uh, are also welcome to do the same. We're working on logistics for the event at this point, which include ordering flowers, uh, chairs, as well as small breakfast items, because it will be in the morning. Our plan at this point is to memorialize staff members that have unfortunately passed due to COVID-19, as well as honor family members and staff, as well as scholars who have also been impacted by COVID-19 and allow those employees uh, who have time that day to come and pay their respects and possibly lay a rose on the memorial and say a few words if they'd like to. This memorial is meant to remember uh, but also for overall healing of our district and just to acknowledge what a painful but also what a resilient year we've had. Again, we are working with Chase with the logistics and they have been so instrumental in getting this done. It's, it's an important project. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Garcia? Thank you, Madam President, Dr. aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, everyone in attendance. Uh, one question, will uh, the scholars be able to attend, should they, uh, or the entire Cartwright community, because as you mentioned, everyone has been affected. That's a good question, and that's something we can certainly consider. Uh, in meetings at this point, we were only opening up to staff members who wanted to come and join, or those who were affected by it, but that's certainly something we can talk about. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. When you say everyone, do you mean like all 15,000 plus students? <laughs> I was referring to those who have uh, been impacted in, uh, on a personal level, family, mothers, fathers, children, grandparents, uh, our, our Cartwright family, you know, and scholars who have connected with someone that they lost here. So, would that include the entire body? That's a very good question. Um, board President, members of the governing board, Ms. Garcia, audience. To be honest, it's been really difficult. Um, it's a very difficult um, subject, but it's also been very difficult of how to communicate. And so what we have decided to do, and we're gonna be talking to the principals about this, is having our principals and our department leaders actually 
be their, their, they know their, their um, departments and their schools the most, so they know which staff members and or families are impacted. And so that would be the way that we'd be able to reach them. We didn't want to do a mass, um, you know, because we want some RSVP. So we um, definitely can ensure when we, and Jeremy, you're here, so you can kind of help um, th them understand um, that we're really asking it to be um, um, not a mass email, but just a very a delicate, you know, reach out. We do have a few staff members at Veronica's reaching out to their families whose names will, we're getting permission to put their actual names on the, um, the memorial, and then there'll be a general one for fa family and staff. And so um, it's certainly any principal or any department head that knows of a scholar who lost someone, they certainly would be invited. We'd want to include them to certainly come. I appreciate that, and thank you. Um, that I, I like, I love the idea. But also, in addition, perhaps we could even consider the principals doing their having their own type of recognition at their individual schools. And if they wanted to invite the board, then of course, you know, that would extend that invitation. Then I'd be more than happy to support them as well. But I, I, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. So we're moving on to item three, which is our update for the strategic planning with the board and principals. Dr. Aguilar Luller. Um, thank you, board president, members of the board, audience, special guests. As you know, we had our first strategic planning last month. Our next one is coming up on October 28th, and we're going to be really digging deep and talking about our budget, our state of the district. And so I'm really looking forward uh, to having us all there again together so that we can make some very difficult decisions together as a board and site leaders. And then we can um, take that information to our PAC, to our CAT, and to um, those other stakeholders in our district. Um, so as we're planning for next year, um, everyone has, um, has heard, been communicated, and um, know what's going on in our future. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aguilar Luller. The next item is our district office art display for month of October. So our Cartwright District Office Art Display for October 2021. You can see our beautiful art located here in the back of the boardroom and then also outside of the boardroom in the glass cases. There is more beautiful art out there as well. Um, so we'll just kind of go through each of the displays. So for our first display, which is actually in the back here, um, that is our Frank Borman Elementary display. Uh, the teacher is Mr. Nello. The principal at um, Frank Borman is Sierra McAllister. And the title for the artwork is The Abstract Self-Portrait. So young artists demonstrated skills in drawing and painting by creating an abstract portrait in the style of Pablo Picasso. Scholars began by drawing two large heads on a white watercolor paper to create frontal and profile views. They then added a neck and shoulders to their portraits. To complete the portrait drawing, students added eyes, eyebrows, mouth, ears, nose, hair, and other details to the clothing. Before painting their portraits, they outlined their drawings with a Sharpie marker and prepared for painting by cleaning all pencil marks with an eraser. Scholars learned how to create light and dark colors by mixing black and white to any color to make tints and shades. They then painted each side a different color using the tints and shades variations. To complete the final artwork, scholars cut their finished abstract portraits and glued them to a non-objective watercolor painting they had created in the previous lesson. Thank you to all of our students for the seventh and eighth grades at Frank Foreman Elementary for providing us such incredible artwork. Our next display is actually um, outside the boardroom. And as you're walking into the boardroom from the parking lot, you can um, easily see the beautiful artwork out there. The teacher is Kelly Freeman, 
Our school is Glen L. Down Social Sciences Academy, and the grades are second and seventh. The principal is Miss Vivian Nash, and the title is Los Dias de los Muertos on Aluminum and Paper. Second and seventh grade learners learned about Los Dias de los Muertos, or the Days of the Dead. It is celebrated in Mexico and other areas that recognize the Catholic All Saints and All Souls Day. It is celebrated on November 1st and 2nd. On these days, they celebrate the remembrance and honor loved ones that have passed away. There are many traditional activities on these two days. Some of these examples are creating an altar to commemorate the deceased, making sugar scales, skulls, skeleton toys, going to the grave of the loved ones, lighting candles, sharing prayers and stories are all part of the tradition. The second graders designed, drew, and colored symmetrical skull masks. We looked at authentic Dias de los Muertos artwork. We modeled our designs after the flower shape and line designs we saw. The seventh graders used aluminum, a commonly used material, to create their escuelitos or, es or skeletons. Each repoussé piece has convex, concave, and natural areas. Permanent marker was used for color. These toys mirror any position that may have been held in real life. For example, teacher, basketball player, musician, to name a few. Thank you very much to our second and seventh grade, se second and seventh graders at um, Glen L. Down Social Science Academy. I definitely noticed the art display when I walked in today. It was awesome. So our third display this evening is located right over here. And the teacher is Allison Pang. The school is Peralta. And we have kindergarten, first, second, third, and sixth graders. The principal is Christine Ramirez. And the title is Printmaking, Radial Symmetry, Texture Owls, and Line Landscapes. Sixth grade students learned the process of printmaking with styrofoam and markers, and then they created their own print to make a radial design. After completing their print four times to make a circle, the students got creative to make their artwork even more unique with construction paper. Second and third grade students learned about the parts of a landscape, foreground, middle ground, and background, while also focusing on using a variety of lines. Scholars then practiced their painting skills and on having good craftsmanship. Kinder and first grade students learned about texture and ripped their own feathers from construction paper. We focused on making the owls fluffy and feathery to get the right texture for this specific animal. So definitely please enjoy the art. Thank you to Peralta, kindergarten, first, second, third, and sixth graders. I know the artwork is one of our most favorite things to see when we're in the governing board room. So thank you. And I appreciate the honor of explaining um, all of the different varieties of art that we have on display. So thank you. And with that, we will move on to item five, which is Susan Doyle and Michella Stevens for our meet and confer update. I'm making her come up. I know she doesn't want to. <laughs> Madam President, members of the Governing Board, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, executive team and guests, um, thank you for having us up here to give you an update. Um, the Actually, the meet and confer team has met several times already. Mm -hmm. I believe we've met three times. Yes. And I believe we have a really strong and dedicated team on both sides, both the CEA team and the uh, board team. We had a great presentation from our CFO, Victoria Farrar, last night at our meeting regarding um, some of our concerns with, with finance and budget. Um, Gary Holland, who's also a member of our team, the Director of Finance, weighed in on that too and was, was a great support um, um, to Ms. Farrar. So we currently have uh, three proposals from the um, CEA team that are under consideration. Mm -hmm. One of those is dealing with class sizes. Uh, one of those is dealing with the structure for sci uh, school psychologist salaries. And the final one is dealing with the salary structure for the related staff, the itinerant services such as um, occupational therapists, um, uh, speech therapists, no, not speech, occupational and physical therapists and no, things RSPs, like that. Yes. So that's, that's what we've done so far. Um, 
I think, as I said earlier, it's a great group, and I, I think we'll, we are working well together, even though Michella did not want to come <laughs> up here with me. So. Yes. so any questions for us? Thank you, ladies. Any questions from the governing board? No flipping tables? We're not all so good? far. Not so <laughs> far, but you know, we're not we're not done yet. <laughs> all right. Well, it's great to see the camaraderie. Uh, definitely looking forward to the updates when we get to that point. Um, and great job, ladies. Thank, Thank you, you. To, to both teams. <laughs> Thank so please you. express our gratitude to the teams. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is Dr. Cruz giving us an update on public information regarding our letter grade and data. Good evening, President Hernandez, Governing Board, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, Executive Leadership Team, and those watching home on YouTube. Um, just an update for our um, Governing Board and our community. Um, this year, letter grades uh, will not be released by uh, the Arizona Department of Education. They were um, put on hold, obviously, for lots of reasons, but most of all due to the pandemic and all of the issues with our with testing, et cetera. Um, however, due to um, statute, they still have to release certain components of the letter grade, certain data components. So. Those data components will be released coming up here soon before November 1st. So we wanted to give all of you a heads up that that will be coming. Um, we're not exactly sure what day they will be released. Um, they don't really give us a heads up about that, but we, as soon as we know, we will let you know. And we just wanted to give you all a heads up about that. And certainly we'll, we'll um, let you know as soon as we know. Um, governing Board President, members of the Governing Board, thank you, Dr. Cruz. Um, could you remind the Governing Board how many scholars actually did take the AZ Merit or uh, try to? Yeah, right. We, we had very, very few <laughs> take our AZ Merit. If we remember, our, our number of students that were tested um, were down considerably um, from the number tested prior years um, due to safety reasons, right? They they wanted to stay home due to safety reasons. So that impacted scores significantly. Um, so I, I just want all of those things that to keep in mind when we look at, at those scores. Um, other things are coming as well from the State Department. Um, all of these things come down as a part of, of federal law as well. So I just wanna keep you abreast of all of those things. Um, they have to, um, uh, they have to identify lowest performing schools. We don't think any of our schools will be a part of that. Um, lots of our schools, even though we were in the pandemic, made really a lot of a lot of growth last year. Even though we didn't have a lot of our scholars test, we felt we made significant gains um, given given all of the circumstances. So we are waiting on that as well. Um, however, we don't. We don't know what that will look like yet. Um, that is coming sometime after the end of this month. We will know more after the state board meeting um, this coming week. So we just wanted to keep you abreast of that and, and we will let you know as soon as we know anything. Can I answer any questions for Thank anybody? Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Um, any questions from the governing board? I know, deep breath. We're deeping, we're deep breath. Yeah. All Madam, of these things. Madam President, fellow board members, uh, Dr. Lawler and executive team. Um, I've kind of been keeping um, uh, in, in a com some communication with uh, fellow board members nationwide to see what they're looking at as well. Certainly this is not limited to Arizona, it's, it's around the nation. But still, I think the message that I'm hearing back and and it's just the, the aggressiveness. I think we've got to get ready for, well, not get ready, we've got to be implementing um, and planning for those aggressive approaches um, that are outside that box that weren't in there in, in an effort to, to, you know, to, to help catch up somehow. 
I understand the word catch up. I'm using it very loosely, but um, to gather, you know, gain, to have some gain. Um, it's, I know it's a difficult challenge, but, but I'm all for it and I'm willing, uh, willing and able to partake in how we move forward with that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Um, I also just wanted to comment that I do feel good that, I mean, I feel like one of the positive things here is that our parents felt, and, you know, staying connected with our parents, having our PAC, um, our PAC president and our parents and all of the people that give us their, t so freely of their time um, to be a part of the discussions and to help us, you know, gauge where we're going, where we've been and where we're at. I do appreciate that the parents felt really safe in keeping their students, their scholars home and that it wasn't a negative thing from, it wasn't a negative view from us to the parents as a school district, like we just need to get our scores. And um, I, I really appreciate that. And I hope that our parents, well, I don't hope, I know that our parents appreciate it. Because I know that a lot of times we're really just pushing for those scores. Like, I know that we've talked about this before, that our scholars, and this isn't just us at Cartwright, this is just how it's built. Um, and unfortunately, we have to follow the, the, you know, the laws and the rules. So we try to work around it. Um, but I do appreciate that our parents were able to keep their scholars home without the pressure of all of us trying to make them, you know, force them to bring their kids in, do the test, and put them potentially in what um, was a dangerous situation. So I do appreciate that, especially from our district, that it wasn't us pressuring parents just to get those test scores. I do feel like our students have made gains. We've come a long way from where we were before. Um, and so I just want to reiterate that our test scores don't um, necessarily place value on who we are. That's our determination. And I think that it's, it is what it is, honestly. The stance that we took was that we were gonna keep our community, our teachers, our families, our scholars, parents, and our community safe. And if that means that our test scores or letter grades or specific components aren't where um, the, the powers that be want them to be, then it's, it's when we take a real look at it and make that determination in ourselves that we still stand strong and be proud of our, our ourselves, um, our scholars and our parents and our staff and everyone. And you know, it, I know it seems like such a terrible, it seems like real ominous when we talk about it. But I mean, we did, we did our best. We did our best and I just appreciate that we, as a governing board, supported our parents and and their decisions to keep their students home. So, um, thank you, Dr. Cruz. I just Absolutely. wanted to share that. Absolutely, thank and, you. You know, and to our parents for being here through that and our PAC for going through those virtual meetings with us and still sticking through. Um, and so I value that. So thank you, Dr. Aguilar Waller for ensuring that we were still continuing with those meetings. Ms. Martinez for helping us to stay coordinated and connected to our parents. Um, throughout the pandemic so we could know how to react, what you were thinking, how parents were feeling. Um, that means more than the scores in, in my mind. So thank you, Dr. Cruz. Um, Ms. Hernandez. Thank you, Madam President, fellow board members, Dr. Lawler um, and executive team. And I'm just thinking it's, um, I'm one of those parents and we stayed home, uh, they, they stayed home and so I've got no, no, um, you know, I, I thoroughly understand, but I don't think it's something I'm not feeling like we, we were let down by any means. Uh, every, look at what's happening, what happened around the nation. I'm glad we kept them home. What, what I'm behind and what I'm, what I'm saying is uh, that we've got to take an aggressive approach in working with our parents moving forward to, uh, to be realistic in the loss and, and how we, you know, it was a setback, not our fault. I'm just saying aggressively put strategically, go for, move forward in a way that we're working with our parents, our communities, because aside from that, uh, the absence of, the, of the, uh, the academics and education, I can just tell you to any street corner, to, you know, send you to 51st and McDowell and, uh, it, and what's happening with our kids. We're losing them, uh, you know, yeah. 
it, it's just astronomical. But I'm just saying we've got to be willing to do, and we're not going to apologize for anything. Uh, this is something that everybody's going through. I think the, the success is going to be seen in how we move forward and how we pick up and how we push. We're going to have to push everybody, including our staff, our kids, our families, uh, you know, to, to regain something uh, as we move forward. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Um, board President, um, members of the Governing Board, Ms. Hernandez, and audience and special guests, I'm so thankful that you said that because it does remind mm -hmm. me again of the conversation that we had on Monday night with the PAC meeting and also um, an opportunity for an upcoming meeting to talk about some of those things that we are doing to catch our kids up, um, like hiring acceleration specialists. And so I'd love to be able to share some of those things. But I was very inspired. And Alma was there and Ms. Hadegui was there so inspired by our parents on Monday night because several of them had taken advantage of the, they actually quit their jobs so that they could get hired as at-home support specialists. And we paid them. Thank you to the governing board for allowing us to put that out of the box thinking. Um, but they were so inspired about, you know, this is hard work teaching. But now they want to be teacher assistants. They want to, they learn so much. And now they want to get their GEDs and they want to become a, you know, Cartwright teacher assistant. And those that are assistants want to be teachers now. I think that, um, you know, the pandemic, I'm not think is, is, was, is horrible and it's just been terrible. But you always have to look at the positive things that came out of it. And our parents want the training. They want to be trained, so we're going to have a couple of our principals um, talk to the other principals about an early literacy model training for our parent liaisons to learn in order to teach our parents. They, they said, we want to learn more about how to help our children at home because we don't believe it's the school by themselves. We want to do this. and so. I mean, Alma and, and, and Alma, you were there. It was, it was very inspiring, Ms. Martinez. I don't know if I missed anything. If you'd like to share, please do. But uh, we have an incredible, um, we have incredible parents and families, and we have learned a lot together. And they want to continue to learn and help our scholars to catch up. And so we're going to start that right away, and, that, and we do have to be aggressive about it. So if I missed anything, Dr. Cruz, please share. Um, President Hernandez, Mrs. Hernandez, uh, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, Superintendent Leadership Team, members at home, um, you caught so many things. And I just want to say thank you to our governing board for all of your incredible support. And our parents at home, it, the support is truly amazing, and our staff feels that. They are working so incredibly hard to do what you were saying, Mrs. Hernandez. And I will tell you, we, we do have many things planned, and they are working hard to, to bring everybody up to speed and, and push forward. Um, planning many of those activities, um, talking about literacy, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, working with Dr. Jasmer and her team to put together some of those parent nights for those literacy activities coming forward in, in this semester and some next semester, um, so important. So working forward to think out of the box and think what can we do to, to get some of those extra things in the hands of our parents to just get them past, you know, that little little push for those things that, that will make a difference for our children at home. So I, I, we hear you, and believe me, we're thinking all the time about what, what's going to make those, those little differences. Um, so if you have ideas, please bring them to us. We're, we're, we're open. I'm sorry, we're giggling over here, not, not to distract, but I made a comment too. Uh, and I'll share, Madam President, fellow board members, and Dr. Cruz, and executive team. Um, we, we have, I've been on the board maybe 17 years, um, and I think I'm going to, going to mention, um, and I mentioned it before, have had uh, many a staff member, you know, always offering solutions. And I came back when I got onto the board, I, I was just so frustrated and upset and was, you know, was it was differentiated studies, I think. That, that's, what I, that's what I was looking for. That was my question. How is it that the teacher in the classroom 
uh, is going to be able to work with my child that perhaps needs some assistance at the same time keep multi-level kids in the classroom. That's why I ran for, for this position. Um, and I was a parent and at not hearing uh, at the time, you know, uh, uh, a response period, which is why I chose to, to, um, to run for this position. It, I know it's an uphill battle. I know what we've been through. Um, it's not so long ago we, we were asking, um, we were revamping, you know, our, our restructuring, I'm going to say, uh, from policy to, to books to uh, curriculums to staffing, you name it. I know we're going to be, uh, it's, gonna, it's that uphill battle. I was thinking, though, I, when you mentioned the, the parent group, um, we, we're a very talented community. I wouldn't be surprised if we have. I wish the AmeriCorps, many, many years ago, uh, ASU, I know there was, there was funding for, is it the AmeriCorps, Ameri AmeriCorps teaching? Uh, there was monies to be able to, uh, to help provide education to uh, anybody that had perhaps maybe uh, some kind of education already that we're building on and rec recruiting. Who's the AmeriCorps teacher? I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, and Mrs. Ms. Haragi, I know this is uh, something that you were, the, the Bridges program as well was doing oh. some of that, but, but there was a bilingual, what was that? Um, uh, I don't want to say a bilingual department or there was um, bilingual things. There was a lot going on at a certain time here before uh, propositions in English only and you name it in education. Uh, but there was a full bona fide, and I, and I would hope that those have, that remain in, in contact with uh, elected officials, uh, if you're going to put funding back into education, uh, put it into, into uh, paying for education for those adults that might have an inclination to go into the teaching profession, such as, you know, from our own community. But Absolutely. We'd be hiring teachers and training them and developing but that's, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Mr. Lopez, and then Ms. Garcia. No questions? Oh, sorry. I thought I ignored him for a long time, I'm sorry. You had um, a comment. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments? Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Thank you very much. Board President, members of the Governing Board, um, special guests, audience, and those that are um, viewing on YouTube, I want you to know that um, Victoria Farrar, Chief Financial Officer, is a very happy person. She has great news all the time, and lately she's been having to share some challenging information. And so I really want you to pay particular attention to her update on the K-12 aggregate expenditures because this has a huge impact on our budget for this school year. So um, you're always giving bad news and it's not fair because you're such a happy, friendly, wonderful person. So Victoria Farrar. Thank you, Board President, Governing Board members, Dr. Aguilar Lawler members of the executive and cabinet teams and everybody in attendance in person and online. Yes, uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. I have been Debbie Downer lately because it seems that you get a little bit of good information for every step forward. You have to take two and a half steps back and then maybe you'll take you know three steps forward and you got a half a step ahead and then all of a sudden you're four steps backward again. So it's been one of those, one of those uh, months for, for me, so thank you. So the bad news is that Proposition 208 was challenged. This is the, the surcharge tax to fund education that was put on the ballot last year. The state challenged it. It went to court. There was a hearing. The Supreme Court stated that the proposition itself was valid. So, you know, that's a win. That's, it's valid. However... It is not exempt from the aggregate expenditure limit. And nor is what used to be Proposition 301, Classroom Site Fund, B 
because that expired in 2020. And once it expired and was not reauthorized by the voters with an exemption, that also lost its exemption from the aggregate expenditure limit. So what is the aggregate expenditure limit? Back in 1980, if you want to go to the other, the other document. Back in 1980, the, this one, the legislature uh, proposed a series of several amendments to the Arizona Constitution. I think I was four years old at this time. Let's <laughs> think about how old I was. Um, so the bad, thing, <laughs> the bad thing about this is that the current system that we use to fund education in the year 2021 is based on a system that was set in 1980. There's a maximum limit for cities, towns, counties, as well as school districts. So those were all part of those 10 amendments. And there are limited opportunities for inflation and some opportunities for changes in student enrollment when you're looking at it from a statewide perspective. So for as far, you know, from a statewide perspective, there's only so much that they'll fund for increases in inflation and increases in enrollment. So what does this mean? The Supreme Court remanded back to the trial court to determine what the impact, the fiscal impact would be adding classroom site fund dollars back into the, the calculation because for 20 years, 21 years, it was exempt. So you could have raised $50 million, $100 million, $500 million from classroom site that was designated in a specific way to go to universities in K-12 with some, some to the state, but there, it had to be spent a certain way. There was no way around that or what the, the legislature could use that for. Since it's lost that protection, it has also lost its exemption. So now the Joint Legislative Budget Committee ran that formula calculation and determined that in the current year, we're talking about 2022, this year that we're in right now, we've already issued contracts. We've already issued, um, we already have people employed, we've you know, bought supplies, we've done a lot of things already. That including the 301, and, and this is, does not account for any funds for Prop 208. So there's you know, not even calculating Prop 208 yet because there, there's, still, there's still other means and changes and tax brackets that affect what's gonna be collected. Just considering 301, the state is over $1.2 billion in aggregate expenditures for the current year. So that means about $1,300 per student for this year, and I estimate that to be about 18 million in the current year. The good thing, we have federal funds COVID relief funds, ESSER, that we can use to make sure that we don't go over budget. What's the option? The legislature can authorize an exemption to the limit, but the legislature has to do that with a super majority in both chambers. 66% in the House and the Senate have to approve an, an exemption. It's not a simple majority that can approve that. So in January, we're hoping that the legislature will allow an exemption and then we wouldn't have to worry about that $18 million for now. And then they can, they can do that every year. They can authorize an exemption every year. Another problem is that anytime you have a tax increase or request a tax increase, the every time the legislature wants to do a tax increase, it has to be done by a supermajority in both chambers. But a simple majority can reduce taxes. So that's just a higher barrier anytime you want to actually go and increase taxes. So this, if it stands and the legislature does not authorize an exemption, this is the largest cut to K-12 in Arizona's history. So that's why I have been Debbie Downer for like a week. Um, it's just been very stressful. Um, 
And Ms. Farrar, can you tell them that what the $18 million in the federal funding was going to be used for this year? Absolutely. We had earmarked those for construction projects. We had always intended some of the funds for ESSER to be used to um, stabilize de declining enrollment. And in, in the theory, the idea is to make sure that we increase student achievement by not having to reduce staffing. So that was the original. So we had always set aside funds for that, but we did not count on an $18 million current year hit because we just found out about this recently. So I'm sorry. Any questions? Okay. We will be talking more about this at our October strategic planning. So look forward to having that discussion. Any questions from the governing board? I guess no questions, but we will now share <laughs> in the sadness. Um, it's kind of a tragedy that a simple majority could lower taxes because that typically only happens for the most affluent of our state. Um, if I may add one thing, I was asked, well, what can we do? I said, well, we can go back to the voters and do another initiative to reauthorize 301. That's what we can do. So that is a good thing. We can do that. Invest in Ed is very good at collecting signatures. So we can always take it back to the voters and then it would be exempt again. So it doesn't have to stay this way. But it's going to be voter initiative driven. So, so then, okay, I guess we could discuss that too, depending on what happens. Um, I think we're all just a little shocked right now to ask any questions, but um, I feel a little more secure knowing that you're our um, chief financial officer. So um, thank you, Victoria. Uh, we will deal with this some more at strategic planning and I'm sure uh, as time progresses, we'll continue to deal with it as well. Thank, thank you, Ms. Victoria. All right, and with that, we're going to move on to board updates. Ms. Garcia, would you like to start us off this evening? Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, all those in attendance and online. That, um, that was a downer, gosh. <laughs> But that is, um, that's called being transparent. And I appreciate that because now we get to have some real discussion. Wow. Um, so aside from that, I'm in recovery mode. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I don't have much of an update other than uh, my allegiance to this Cartwright family and to our community. Uh, also, uh, one thing I wanted to bring to light is that uh, we've uh, known about the fentanyl um, epidemic uh, and how it has affected um, people nationwide in this state specifically and in this community specifically. So just to bring awareness about that uh, fentanyl, they, uh, it is being called now FETTY, F-E-T-T-Y. And so um, as I'm doing my work out in the community, I, I also carry uh, medication that will help someone in, in case I, which I, God forbid, encounter someone who has overdosed. But the, the reality is that it's here and it's alive, the epidemic that is. So we need to become uh, more proactive, educating our families, our scholars, and wondering if perhaps we can even entertain the idea of our home liaisons uh, speaking to this topic at um, the cafecitos as well as our SELs being proactive and discussing these, um, this epidemic with our scholars and teaching them um, the pros, uh, well, there is no pro, the cons, 
as well as protecting themselves and their families and just being mindful and aw creating awareness. Um, and that would uh, conclude my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. I learned on TikTok that they call them blues. Um, sorry, it's not my update. I just wanted to share it with Ms. Garcia and with the public. There is a young man in Phoenix that actually goes around and speaks to um, people that have addiction issues, and the most popular one, of course, is fentanyl, which starts, as, a, as we all know, with legal prescriptions. Um, so some of the issue is it's a totally different issue than, you know, like what maybe we were used to as kids which is like your friends introduce you to something and then you're like, yeah. Um, this is more something that's being provided by doctors as a legal form of drugs and then becomes the addiction and spirals out of control. Um, anywho, I'm gonna let it go for now, but we definitely, um, definitely something to think about and share for sure with our families. And then also just for people to kind of think about these are people so um, it is offensive to make fun of them, just as kind of a, not here in the board, but just as, like for our public, these, they are people. So let's try to think of them as people and, and our families as well. They're people and we just need to try to offer them our support and help. So thank you for bringing up the topic. Uh, yeah, speaking to that, uh, Madam President, uh, the, the idea of it being a prescription drug, I think, I believe that would be the minority population. The majority popu of this population that is uh, being affected on a daily basis is because this, uh, the Fetty, the fentanyl is now a street drug and it's easily attainable. And this is where the creating awareness comes in so that we can educate our families and our scholars to not be fooled by something that they may think as recreational that can truly have a, a horrible impact on themselves as well as the, the death rate, including the, um, their families being affected. So thank you. The last thing I wanna say on it, sorry, Ms. Garcia, um, is that there's no regulations when it's a street drug on how much is actually in the pill that your child could actually be taking. Um, so it is extremely dangerous, definitely a good topic. It's, been, it's just been out in a lot of conversation lately and especially with how dangerous it is because one pill could even by touching it kill you, which sounds kind of crazy and irrational, but it's the truth. So uh, again, thank you for bringing it up and I, Look forward to hopefully having some, when we have those cafecitos, to be able to share that with our parents. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lopez or Ms. Hernandez? Mr. Lopez? Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, executive team, and those in the audience. Uh, thank you again for being here. I was trying to recall if I had shared my update about the uh, CUBE conference that I attended and um, I have my receipts with me for Christine, so that means that I haven't shared <laughs> um, last month. <laughs> um, they're overdue for business, but I, they're here. Um, well, one of the things, you know, great conference. I don't have my brochure with me uh, and some of the notes that I took throughout the um, sessions that I had. Uh, definitely, it was a good refresher from um, the last uh, conference that I attended and the first term that I served. Um, the district. One of the key takeaways um, that I had, and it definitely applies to our district, uh, given our, our ethnicity and, and population that we have, is um, they do have a um, Latino Association for Public, um, Latino Association for Parents of Public Schools. They call it LAPS. So it's a very engaged group of parents. Um, throughout the um, community in Atlanta, Georgia, who is focused at strengthening uh, relationships um, with elected officials, holding them accountable, not only at the city level, school level, legislature. Um, when I saw the presentation and I learned about it, 
it, it brought me to the Australia Moms or the Parent Advisory Council that we have. Uh, it's a very engaged group um, of parents who are not only engaged at the schools on a partnership with the school districts um, in the state, but also there are key stakeholders uh, in many other government agencies uh, and legislative process along the way uh, at the Capitol in, in Georgia. So I had the opportunity to speak to uh, some of the founding members of the association. I, um, it is my hope that over the next year we can invite them over um, to our district uh, to see what we have with our parent liaisons, with our parent advisory council, um, with some of the um, cafecitos, and, and really uh, this could be an opportunity for us to, per, you know, perhaps, you know, the long-term vision that they have is to start LAPS, um, Latino Association of Parents for Public Schools, all across the nation, you know, really you know, get get the parents united uh, and, and demand not only accountability, but also bring, you know, something to the table. So I do have the business card of their organization. I will pass it over to um, Christine and Linda as well. And I'm hoping that we can engage on a um, conversation with them uh, down the line. Um, one of their missions is to go to districts across the nation at no cost to us to really see what we're doing and provide feedback. So, you know, I don't think it's gonna incur any cost uh, to our district, but it's definitely something that we can uh, utilize to increase um, and strengthen the relationship that we have with the parents. So I'm hoping that down the line we can tackle that, that, uh, that need. Um, aside from that, I am um, happy to be here. My apologies for being late. Um, Work is keeping me busy lately as well, and I am looking forward to the uh, groundbreaking ceremony tomorrow, so on Saturday, today's Thursday, two days from now, um, for these events as well. And we also had a chance to attend the um, Mexican Fiesta for the base baseball, although we were told that we were going to be recognized by the councilwoman, and that didn't happen. I but. Uh, Yes, I was going to tell you that, you know, they were there and, you know, uh, but nevertheless, it was a good event. Thank you, Veronica, for, you know, bringing that to us, a good opportunity for us to, you know, have some fun time and I think forget about, you know, the issues that we're facing as a district and just join the community. So with that, um, thank you to all of you again for your hard work and dedication. Uh, you are the frontline soldiers of this district. You are the face and uh, we thank you for your service. Uh, that will conclude my update. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. <clears throat> Ms. Hernandez? Oh, by the way, that group uh, that you mentioned out of Georgia, because um, you mentioned holding, you know, uh, working with parents, holding uh, elected officials accountable. By any chance, was there, is there, is that the, in community organizing? Is there any connection to the, um, uh, interface, net, you know, nationwide interface net, network. I kind of it's it sounded like. Yeah, the, I'm sure there is a connection because I, you know, during the presentation and the reception, as soon as I walked in, it was fully community organizing. So I'm sure they did derive from that sector. Um, I'll do some follow up and I'll introduce you to the to the group as well. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Lopez. I've, well, and, and, and I understand the dynamics of the, you know, our restrictions and uh, especially when we're discussing, budge discussing budget um, and to truly understand how those were, how those types of groups are effective, uh, it's teaching and building capacity and it's long term. I mean, we have cops in San Antonio, we have, uh, you know, what is it, Valley Interface groups all over South Texas, where I'm coming from here in, in the state of Arizona. We have them at work and at play. However, it's a challenge because it's personal investment in, in you know, going to constant meetings. It's, it's, as a volunteer, there's no pay. So you do, I did it for years, but it, I learned a lot, right? I learned a lot that, well, that's a lot, another story. But I'll thank you for that, thank you for that. Um, gives me some continued inspiration and hope in that hopes and that it's going somewhere going on somewhere else as, a, as school districts we tend to uh, contract 
with an organization that uh, will provide a presentation, a PowerPoint to parents. They come, they listen, and, you know, I hope you learn something and we'll see you later. But so that that's very different. Um, so I look forward to uh, looking what they look like and see what we can do here. Um, I don't want to be all over. I'm glad to be here. Uh, and I'm sorry, I did miss. I, I had my grandson who came down with RSV, and he, had, he was, you know, having difficulty breathing. I'm like, okay, I had promised here, and I have here. I said, we're going, we ended up going to the hospital that evening. So I'm sorry, but por algo suceden las cosas. Things happen for a reason. Um, but, you know, the, the fentanyl issue, the drug issue, I think it's all, we're all related. It, the education, the lack of education, the lack of opportunities, uh, the lack of work, uh, especially during these times. Um, YouTube. I, I mean, I've, I've had some time even myself in spending my time with my grandson in that, I mean, we have people out there recording, interviewing, uh, you know, folks that are out here in the streets, the homeless, the numbers that are building, any street that you take. Um, you know, throughout our community, cars that are parked. I've, I've found people sleep in their car uh, thinking, oh, they're homeless and they're in some kind of, you know, you can't wake them up having to call, um, you know, emergency. I, I, you know, as a parent, worry all the time. I think I started this journey when my daughter was just going into high school. And I shared publicly about the friends and how many I invited over and how we're having discussions. And since then, have shared, you know, throughout how many friends they've lost. Uh, that number has increased uh, just in this year alone. Uh, finding them asleep in their in their beds, um, you know, due to drugs. Um, I've got, I, you know, I don't want to go into the, this drug issue, but I, I've had, I'm very conservative when it comes to the, um, you know, to even marijuana because I believe that you you begin where, somewhere, and there's there's a there's a debate, a nationwide debate, as we all know, and unfortunately that comes with money. And money moves things and people to make decisions, to vote for things that we wouldn't otherwise be considering at one time or another. Um, at, at the end of the day, it's about money, lack of, and education, and all the resources. I'm just glad to partake and learn. And by the way, I remembered it's the Urban Teacher Corps that I was thinking about. There was funding for implementation to pay uh, folks out of our community, our, te you know, our teacher's assistance, um, I remember I was many, many years ago, I was part of the, um, um, uh, what is it, the um, Osborne School District. And there was something that I was uh, forgetting was the, um, the bilingual, the Arizona Association for Bilingual Education. I'm sure there are doctors in, in our Latino community, Dr. Leva, that were very active in that, that helped secure that partnership and funding back then. So uh, that's, that's an idea that I like. But I'm glad to be here, and I, I'll keep it at that and keep, let us go home. And, oh, I'm sorry. And also, the, I was right. It is passed. <laughs> when I don't want to vote, but I do want to vote, I just want to you want to see how everybody else votes so that I can think about it a little bit more. It's called just pass on my vote. Okay. So not, uh, not abstaining, because abstaining would be I don't want to vote, period. But which I've used as well, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, th I'll just quit, and I'm glad to be here, and glad everybody's here and safe, and looking forward to continued conversations. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. I don't know what there's really left for me to say. Well, everybody already took everything. I will say, though, that the Mexican baseball fiesta was the best baseball I've ever been to in my life. And we get to go to baseball events, so that's not to discredit the other ones, but I'll tell you what. It was like a party over here. <laughs> the mascots were awesome. You know, it was very entertaining. The music was great. And then when we went back upstairs after, like, we were ready to go, there was a whole nother, like, fiesta up there. And I was like, whoa, Denise, we had no idea that this is what was happening up here. But it was just so family oriented. That's the real big part of it is that it was more like family oriented versus like we just got to see sports. It was just really fun and I would do it again. I would love to go back again. It was awesome. It just kind of speaks to um, like how we were talking earlier about Hispanic Heritage Month and that family feel. And it was just, 
I mean, the treats were different. That was cool, too, because, you know, normally it's like a hot dog and whatever. And yeah, you can eat hot dogs anywhere. And it was elotes and chilies, um, chips with chile. And, man, they were so good. You know, it was like tacos. I'm like, when do you ever get tacos at a baseball arena? Never. Yeah, no hot dogs. There were tacos and the, the chips with chile. And it was um, – they had all kinds of stuff. I can't even go through all of it. But, man, it was great. It was uh, literally. Oh, the peanuts. I don't know. what They remind me of Boston baked beans, but they're like. No, it's like a. I can't say it. <laughs> yeah, those are my those are one of my favorites. Um, but just like the family environment that it was, you know, people came with all their little kids and they were dancing and it was just awesome. So definitely thank you to uh, City Council Member and Veronica. And um, on that point, I did run into um, Michael Angelo and Angelo, sorry, Michael, and um, Eman from her office today um, at work. And that was awesome because it, with the pandemic, we haven't seen them in such a long time. So I got to hear some of the great things that are um, moving in the future for our district, which is great, some of the improvement projects. Um, so it was really nice, and definitely it felt great to be sort of like kind of great to be out um, because I, like our parents, tend to stay in. I go to work, I stay there 12 hours, I go home, and that's pretty much all that I do. So it was, not, it was great to be out there again and to see everyone that was able to attend and Mr. Lopez and everyone that was there, and um, it was just really nice. So thank you. It, it just reminded me of sort of how, like what a really our community truly is. It's just, you know, a great time. Everyone's connected. Everyone's just sort of having a good time. There were no issues. It was awesome. Um, what else? Um, I'm excited for this weekend's event. I'm so glad to be here. I'm glad to be back. I publicly apologize to Ms. Martinez and all the PAC parents for not attending the meeting this Monday. Um, but I'll definitely be back at the next one because that is a great, uh, I do enjoy those. And it, it's a great way to be able to connect with our PAC parents and our liaisons at the schools, hear what's going on, how you're feeling, what things we can modify, what's going well, and the celebration. So um, I definitely look forward to the next one um, and appreciate all of the time that all of you spend helping us because we all know that it's volunteer and you, you give so freely of your time and we appreciate that. Um, and that's it. Thank you to all of our staff and all of our Cartwright community and family. And it's great to still be here together and to see our, our board members. So that's it. I'll conclude my update with that. And we will move on to, I know I said I had nothing to say. Um, we'll move on to item nine, which is a request for future agenda items as information and discussion at a future meeting. Um, and then... I have my notes. So some of the things that we requested for the next one, I just want clarification. Um, one of them was the quarterly uh, report of suspensions. Um, Ms. Garcia, will you, what was it that you were requesting? Uh, yes, as in previous uh, meetings we had requested the infractions that were tied into the suspensions as well as the timelines of the suspensions. I believe we had been informed that there were timelines. In other words, it wasn't a suspension that was never ending. Timelines to make sure that we uh, bring the scholars back into the mainstream setting and then looking at the restored, restorative justice, I really like what Mr. Pena had to say about that because, um, of course, we lead by example and um, walking the walk is extremely important. So what does that look like? What, are, what exactly are we doing to make that connection with the suspensions and the restorative? As, uh, okay, so I have a couple of other things that I'd like to bring up, but I'll wait. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just to clarify, the terms and information, is that the actual data or the discipline matrix that kind of shows the outline for what would be an infraction and what the term would be? 
or do you want the actual data of I think of the, students that it that are in it? I think all of that terms. would be important. It would be inclusive. And I also um, would like to speak to what Ms. Hernandez, what you brought up earlier regarding uh, looking at that policy on suspensions. Can we visit that at maybe perhaps a discussion, further discussion to see if that's something that we'd like to address and perhaps update according to where we are now in 2021. Thank you. Um, before you move on to your other items, that was one of my questions, because I know you mentioned the discipline policy, but there's several. Um, are we looking at all of the discipline policies as a whole? Because there's um, JK, JKR, JKEA, JIC. Um, JKED, so there's quite a few. Um, hold on. I think it would be a good idea to sit down and kind of look at any any and all of them yeah. to see. But I, th I feel like maybe that we should review the policies that we have in our books if we have our binders that were provided to us. And then we'll set a meeting um, in the future to actually discuss those and if we could have our edits for our discussion that would be awesome right I, I, off the top of my head I'm not I'm, I wouldn't be able to tell you the, the the acronyms of the letters but I think what I at least from my point of view what I'm uh, what I was addressing is the student disciplinary uh, matrix that shows the uh, uh, what causes the suspensions? In other words, any activity that causes a student disciplinary action uh, and the action that, that, that defines what, that, what the accountability is going to be. And I, that's going to be one. That, it's just the one. I, the others are mar probably going to be addressing other issues, not necessarily the, just the student um, discipl discipline, period. So if you okay. like, I can look at it and tell you which one that is. Um, but to start the and discipline the other might matrix. be a, just a report, a report, uh, a summary report of what, of what it's looking like district wide. Like what are the numbers, and by site, and what are the issues. Just a, a report for that. I think that's feasible. But for now, the discipline matrix. Okay. Um, so then I just have a quick clarifying question: the discipline matrix that we would be provided in the board bulletin. Is that any different than the discipline matrix that's provided in the student parent handbook? Or is it the same? So it is available even on our CSD 83 website. Um, obviously we'll get a copy, but for parents who are interested and for our viewers, it is available on our CSD 83 website, the actual student parent handbook. It comes up really nice too. Um, and you can actually go through the discipline matrix in there. So if any of our parents are interested, it is on the website and it's in the student handbook. Um, it goes over several pages. So just as an FYI, and then yes, uh, the board will get it in the bulletin. And once again, Madam President, would that in also include the uh, timelines or time frame of a suspension? What, what exactly is a long-term suspension? What does that look like as, uh, as far as timeline goes? Is that indefinite? And if that is the uh, answer, then why would that, why would a suspension be indefinite? In other words, are we in compliance regarding these suspensions? I mean, I don't know that we would be out of compliance or in compliance, but what I'm hearing is that if there's a long-term suspension, again, what is the time frame? What are we doing to bring them back into the mainstream? And who tracks that? Well, and the other thing is, sorry, if anybody else wanted to speak really quick. The other thing is, is that I thought there was, and I could be wrong, but I thought there was a directive that if we had a long-term suspension that we would be aware of it. Um, maybe not the complete details because some things we're not privy to as a board, even though we are a board, sometimes we're not privy to specific information, um, but data information we could be privy to. So I think reviewing the policies, looking at the discipline matrix and kind of working together as a board to make sure that we have those truly outlined is a really good idea. Um, because we've talked about it before. Um, 
but we still continue to have suspension. So if we could at least get the data, because it sounds like we really want to know what's happening right now, if I'm hearing correctly from the board. We really want to see what's happening and what our trends are. So if we could get some of the data um, at one of our future meetings, that would be awesome. And then from there, we can look at the policies and uh, see what revisions we, we would want to make as yeah. well. I think one of, one of my concerns, speaking to that, the long-term suspensions, is because of COVID and because of the, the scholars who are learning from home, are we able to identify and separate those that are there for suspension versus those that the families want them to be home? D does that make sense to you? That's where the tracking comes in. So not to forget the scholars who are on long-term suspension, whatever that looks like, but not to, um, I would say, not to take for granted that just because of COVID, they're gonna stay home. So again, I'm looking for, uh, really it boils down to accountability and, and transparency. So are we tracking them? How does that look to not include them uh, into another population of scholars who are learning from home? virtually versus long-term suspension. In other words, I don't want to forget them. Okay. I want to yeah, make sure that they're learning the way they should be learning. And are they returning with the, uh, well, are they given the option to return in person, to in-person learning? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Um, Dr. Lawler, is, that, is it possible to get the data for another one of our future meetings so that we can start having the the discussions. Uh, board president, members of the governing board, um, guests, audience, and viewers. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, at this time, and I don't want to misspeak, but I don't believe at this time we have any scholar on a long-term suspension at the current time. Um, thank you, Emma, for verifying we do not. Um, so we will give you what we um, currently have right now. We definitely have some short suspensions, you know, one day, two day. The most that you would have is up to nine days, which is still considered a short time suspension. And as Mr. Pena said, you're still given the opportunity to 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 learn and, and you know they make sure that they catch them up. And if they do if they're on an IEP, they're supposed to get additional support even through the suspension. So um, we can get you what we have currently right now. And, and definitely ensure that no one falls. I think what you're saying is you don't want anyone falling through the cracks if they end up doing that. But yes, if we do have any scholars that would be up for a long-term suspension hearing, um, the governing board would know that that was occurring. So um, we don't have anyone right now. That's awesome, thank you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Ms. Garcia. Thank you, Dr. Aguilar-Loller. Mr. Lopez? Yes, thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, executive team. Can you um, see working with our legal counsel to see if we can schedule a executive session at some point to talk about that deficit that we may have, the eighteen million dollars? I know in the past we typically go and discuss financial stuff. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Ms. Garcia, you said you had a couple other items or did you already state them? Thank you, Madam President. For future agenda items, I just wanted to know, um, and maybe it doesn't have to be future agenda, maybe it can be sent in, e in an email. Just wondering about the, the literacy, of course, is extremely important, um, as we all know. But wondering about, uh, are we teaching uh, English as a second language and are, or is there a possibility of um, creating, if, if we don't already, if it's not already in the making, a program where the community members can, or families can come and uh, work on their GED? Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Thank you, Dr. aguilar Lawler. Any other requests? Go ahead, Ms. Hernandez. Thank you, uh, Madam President, Dr. Lawler, fellow board members and executive team. Um, 
I'm, I was thinking as I heard the, um, the financial report, uh, along with the, um, the uh, deficit, I was going to recommend if, if we're going to be addressing um, the issue as part of the presentation that was presented today, because it was presented to us um, now, could we have that discussion publicly um, so that we in the community or us in the community are able to have an open conversation about how things happen. Uh, I don't think there's a need to have it in, in, a, in an executive session. That would be just my recommendation. I don't know um, when and if we discuss, decide to do that, but that would be my mind. Uh, and second, um, for our future agenda items, I'd like to, to um, either have, I tend to, I like study sessions. I don't know if we've had any. In, in a while, or uh, it's been a long while. But I'd like to recommend, that, to recommend that we, I'd like to learn more about the construction projects uh, that have been going on. I know for the last year, for the most part, uh, we've been, uh, we've had many. We're, we're revamping, uh, restructuring almost, uh, I think most of our uh, campuses, if not all. And I just, I'm interested in a report to see the, uh, the projects, the pending projects, and also what are the needs? What are the, what are the, the assessments? What are, are we still looking at? Because we just had an announcement, uh, and as I mentioned, I'm rather conservative, and it, it's not my money to spend, but I like to prioritize. And a year ago, I know we had a strategic session and, you know, with staff, and we recommended, we know there were needs, you know, parking lots, you name it, across the um, across campuses across the district um, but there there has been a lot of construction projects and I'd like to learn more about that and just in a report doesn't have to go be too too extensive but an over overview of what's been uh, what's been done what is yet to be done and what are those priorities that are like we need to get done you know before something happens I'd like that you know like some of the things that we've had happen here in a new building um, as well as, you know, like Spitalny, the Spitalny situation. Um. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. We actually just had a strategic planning session. Um, I'm not requesting a strategic planning session. I'm sorry. It's a presentation of construction projects. Right. But we also just had... I'm not against it, but we did just have a strategic planning session to discuss all of those items, um, but I'll defer to Dr. aguilar Lawler. Um, thank you, President Hernandez, um, members of the board, Ms. Hernandez, audience. Uh, so during the, the last um, strategic planning session, we did have a presentation with everything you asked for. However, it was with just principals and the governing board. I'm happy to provide that um, with um, the public in a, in a session um, after our October meeting because we're going to have to make some adjustments based on the conversations that we've had. But we can certainly do that for the a board meeting and have a um, presentation with Victoria and Dr. Madrano. Uh, we have meetings every single Thursday. We have a, um, is it a Google Doc that we use? It's a Google Sheet and we have year one, two, three, we have all the account codes, we have all the, the money to the penny. Um, we look at it, we look at the listening tours, we prioritize, so we'd be more than happy to share it at an upcoming board meeting so that all of our community could see. So I'm happy to do that. Can you just remind us all what date and time the next strategic planning is so that we all are aware and can make sure that we are available to attend? So it's Thursday, October 28th at five o'clock. Um, it'll go through eight. We will have to do some reviewing of the construction projects to show what we had presented to the principals and the governing board um, last month. And based on the holds that we're putting on right now, what those updates would look like. But we, again, want an opportunity to share it with the governing board and our principals so that they know what's going on, and then we do the presentation with the public. Um, you'll have, you know, better information, and we just never have enough time as a board to actually be able to talk and have those discussions. So it is really important. Thank you. 
And I think, Ms., just to add, Ms. Martinez, and um, on Monday, we had, a lo we had a really long TAC meeting, but it was really valuable. Um, she did say that a lot of our parents from the bond committee do want to know uh, what we're doing and updating, and uh, we talked about that today, we're trying to get signs for the community, and also, um, you know, so they can see your bond dollars at work. And I know our, our communications department is working on that as well. And so, even reaching out to our bond committee to give them a rundown with a postcard that says, you know, these are the things that we're doing. So I think the more we can communicate to our community on what we're using their hardworking money for is is just so much. Um, so value to that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any other requests? I think we've covered everything that we were discussing throughout the meeting. Um, all right. So then the next regular meeting with the executive session of the Cartwright Governing Board will be held on Thursday, November it's just still so far away. Sorry, everyone. Um, we'll be held on Thursday, November 18th, 2021 at 5 o'clock p.m. at the Cartwright School District Boardroom. Moving on to item J as adjournment. I'd like to move that we adjourn the Cartwright Elementary School District Regular Governing Board meeting for Thursday, October 14th, 2021. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. So we have a motion made by myself, Mr. Hernandez, and a second by Governing Board Member Pedro Lopez. Um, any discussion? All right, so we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Governing Board Member Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Um, Vice President Garcia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. I vote aye as well. Uh, let the record reflect the meeting has adjourned at 8.03 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for sticking with us this evening. Please be safe on your way home and have a beautiful day.